Hi everyone and welcome to the show again. This is episode number five of The Last Transmission with me, Chris Turner. Tonight I'm joined by another top UK researcher, friend and colleague, Steve Mira. So let's welcome Steve to the show. How are you doing, Steve? Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I'm very well. Oh, you, well, you're welcome. I only saw you an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so... What I don't want to do, Steve, is get into, how did you get into this? Because I know that you've been doing that for 30 years. So 40? I'm skip, yeah, 40 yeah. years. So I'm not going to yeah. ask you how you got into this, because if, if yeah. people want to know that, they can go and check 30 years of, of, of podcasts and interviews that you've done in the past. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's something we did relatively recently together, and, and that's going over an investigation that you did. When was that, Steve? 1996? It's gonna have been about nineteen ninety seven, yeah. were it? It's about ninety seven and yeah, it's gotta be ninety seven, ninety eight. Yeah, and that and that that's the investigation at uh at Winter Hill. And if uh, for anyone uh, that hasn't seen that video, Lorraine, could you just put that video that image of the Winter Hill documentary up, please? Uh, it's just for anyone watching this uh or that might tune into this later down the line. If you haven't seen the documentary that uh that's based on an investigation Steve did uh, on on Winter Hill. Uh, let me see if I can find that for her. I think she's struggling a bit. Where are we? We are. Uh, no, it's not that one. I don't think I've. I don't think I saved it. Never mind. Don't worry about it. Uh, just check that out on the channel, guys. So yeah, Steve. So that case, along with a ton of other stuff that went on up at Winter Hill. Can you tell us all about that case and how it started and, and, and how that all went down? Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had a long interest in Windsor Hill. There's had a, numerous different incidents. I think I first became aware of um, things taking place up and around about Windsor Hill around about 1986, something like that. It's going back a while. And um, I was very close friends with another researcher known as Arthur Tomlinson. Any people that's been in the subject of UFOs in the UK for probably as long as I ever might remember Arthur Tomlinson, he ran an organisation in Manchester called DIGAP, which is Direct Investigation Group for, anomal uh, for Aerial Phenomena. And um, he got involved in a case up there regarding a, a UFO that was seemingly came close down over a road one night <clears throat> and a young girl driving home from work um, I got caught in this light from this object, and she was absolutely petrified. Um, the story has it is that uh, the object followed her for, you know, maybe about a quarter of a mile and then shot off. Uh, but she was in a terrible state. She got home and she was screaming and crying and all sorts of things. And um, her parents tried to calm her down. Now, what is really interesting is, like, the following day is that uh these men turned up at the house uh smartly dressed in in suits and uh and asked the father answered the door and said look you know we, we'd like to talk to your daughter about what she, her about her experience last night about something she'd seen and, and now this is a sort of guy that apparently from what arthur told me was a no-nonsense guy you know he wasn't into the, the government and he was always thinking he was hard done to didn't trust anybody but, you know, the report came in from him saying that 
the daughter was found it very strange that his fa her father just went, yeah, no problem, come on in. <laughs> and she just, just couldn't understand what, why he was acting that way. Anyway, they came in, uh, very stern, didn't get into much conversation. Um, she walked into the into the living room and uh, they, they questioned her about what she'd seen. She told them. Um, and she, it, was, it was her that had to ask who these people were. Not even the father asked. And that's just so profound. And then he went on to literally interrogate the poor girl for about 15 minutes. She was in terrible state. She was crying again and upset. And the mother, my mother came, stormed into the, into the living room and uh, and basically said, what do you think you're doing? And da, 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 da. Her father was just in no state of mind. I don't know what was going on. And uh, these guys just didn't even thank them. They just, they just turned around and left. They didn't say a word. They didn't say thank you or anything or nothing. They just turned around and off they went. Um, and uh, they walked, there was no vehicle outside the house as well. She thought that was unusual. They kind of went outside and seemingly walked off to the left and out of sight. So, you know, again, there were no neighbours right close by me either. So... They were doing a funny uh, no vehicles parked outside the house. Anyway, uh, after that incident, she, uh, her father kind of, this is if he's in some sort of controlled well, state of mind or something. He seemed to come round and was really angry at the fact that, the, you know, that these guys had come into the house and interrogated his daughter. And he couldn't understand why he'd even let them in so willingly. He could remember the events, but doesn't know, doesn't understand his own, you know, reasoning. Uh, over the next few days, the daughter started to have a terrible condition of literally a teeth crumbling. Um, and it, she should wake up with bits of teeth in her mouth. And it was just a terrible thing. And she ended up emergency dental surgery. And they couldn't understand that, you know, that suddenly she was seemingly losing teeth. You know, and she put down some calcium deficiency type uh, problem and stuff. But she hadn't had a problem up to then. And uh, it's a very interesting case. You want to find out more about that? I think you can read it or, um, in one of uh, Jenny Randall's books where she wrote up about Arthur's case um, in the Men in Black book. And uh, it was an interesting case. So I've always interested in up there, I thought, okay. And it's not the first thing that comes to mind, really, because there's been reports of strange beasts, creature, creature, creatures, cryptids type things reported occasionally. I think I've literally got about five or six on record, two of which I investigated, um, and one of which was the uh, the Walk Woods uh, incident. Um, this was two gentlemen who contacted me, and um, this was... They were they were po <laughs> they were poachers actually. <laughs> I mean, I can say it now since the case was so old, uh, but at the time they were a bit worried. I mean, they'd take a trip through in the middle of the night, walk woods, and they'd done this time and time again. They were avid fishermen, and a lot of fishermen do like to do it at night. But these guys were doing it at night because they didn't want to be seen. Uh, and there's some freshwater fish up in out in those reservoirs and things. And there's a small reservoir up there, and they used to go and fish, and they used to enjoy it. And they used to literally go through the middle of the woods in the middle of the night, pitch black, and without any problems, backwards and forwards, have been doing it for over two years. So it was just nothing new that venture through the forest, so to say, until this one particular night. They were heading back from fishing. Um, it was still dark. And as they took the same trip there and back every time we're passing through the forest, they immediately got, it started off with the sensation, with a, with a, a feeling, a feeling of uneasiness, a feeling of being watched. And um, they got a bit skitty and they couldn't understand why they got a bit skitty because it wasn't just one of them. Both of them felt this, uh, which confused them to some degree. They couldn't see anything. Um, they did have torches with them, flashlights and that. So they, uh, they had no problem with switching them on and looking around. I mean, we didn't want to draw attention to themselves, so they didn't have them on much. You know, they knew the path to take. And um, most of the time, if they did have them on, they just pointed them towards the ground because, you know, as you say, they didn't want to be seen uh, traversing backwards and forwards through the forest. Yeah. Um, and at this point, they started to hear in the distant uh, movement. Now, it's still quiet. It's exceptionally quiet. It was very still night from what they said. 
and uh, they got to this clearing and they're about halfway back this clearing from where they went uh, and they know this clearing very well because it denote that this is the place it's kind of halfway point you know through the forest um and they started to hear something and it sounded like his lot well, it sounds like a person they said there's a there's somebody else in the forest who's we're in for it that was the first thing that went through the mind because they thought there was some <laughs> they thought they deserved some type of black op operation <laughs> to find <laughs> out what was going on it's clearly not the mass it's clearly not the case but that's the first thing that went through the mind maybe that there's some covert police trying to capture us or something you know and uh they, they, they sped up the pace um but what in, what was interesting is is that it seemingly was one thing making the movement in the noise in the forest, not multiple. And the faster they quickened their pace, it seemingly this thing also quickened its pace to the point where it was gaining on them. And they kept stopping because they kept feeling that there's going to be a confrontation any minute and they'd rather face an enemy rather than one jump out from behind them. So they were occasionally stopping. Uh, and it got to the point where this thing, whatever this thing was, was described to have, um, uh, it was so loud, it was, it was as if it was larger. It, it, they described it as a couple of horses right, who were walking behind them, banging into bushes and, and stuff. But the, what was frustrating for them is that they couldn't see anything. They couldn't see nothing. And I think the last report I got from them uh, on this matter was the fact that just before they decided to run for it, run for it, they were really, really scared, scared. Was this thing was uh, literally about seven or eight foot in front of them? It was amongst the bushes, um, and they could see the bushes moving. They could hear it breathing, heavily breathing, um, as if it's something which was very large. Um, seemingly walking on two feet because they could hear thuds of steps, loud thud steps. And uh, there was a, a very unusual feeling in the air. And as I, I tried to ask them, you know, well, what do you mean? Can you explain what that feeling was? And he says, well, it was like static, like uh, the air becomes static. Uh, so I said, okay. And I said, was there any unusual um, smells or anything? And he said, no. There was no unusual smells, but the 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 it was as if the whole place became static, and all the hairs on our arms were all stuck up, and, and so on. Uh, at this point, they realised that it was something certainly untoward that they'd never expected, uh, and they ran for it. They ran, they ran for it. They didn't even look back. Now, what's interesting is that when they got to got out of the forest, uh, they, they turned around and stopped, and it was absolutely deadly silent again. Uh, so they, they had no idea. But one thing is for sure, these are two guys that had been down this path through the through the Walker Woods for about just over two years on a regular basis who never had a problem, never feared that location. Uh, they decided that was it, and they never went back. And they're probably, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I talked to them about a year after that event, and they said, you know, no, we've never been back there. No, no way we're going back there. And they never did, as far as I'm aware. Um, it was one of those really strange and profound things. I went there with a with a team. Uh, there was about, I think there was probably about 10 of us going back in the day. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> it's an old photograph. That's an old one. Yeah, and, uh, and that uh, is an old one. And um, we decided to head off and take that very same path. And I have to admit, you know, it's it's a little unnerving. It's, you don't know where, you, where you're walking. It's literally, luckily, they know the area better than we do. Uh, but they would not come with us. They would not, even with us tenables there, they would not come with us, wouldn't even show us the path. They'd go nowhere near. This thing really did scare them. Um, but we didn't see or hear absolutely nothing, nothing. It was it was very, very quiet. I have to say, though, there was a, seemingly an, a, um, an absence of wildlife around and any unusual, any normal sounds you might get from sort of birds and things at night. I couldn't, couldn't you know, all I could hear was the breeze passing through the trees and the darkness and uh, and we we saw nothing. We we went during the day as well, and we found no broken twigs, no footprints, nothing. It's as if whatever was there, I, I really don't know. Um, but we we managed to find the, the clearing, um, and we knew that was, we just did a perimeter search, search, full perimeter search for about 30 feet out, because they said they were in this clearing, and this thing was about eight foot away. So we knew that at some point, if we do a perimeter clearing, 
in a, in a circular fashion. We're going to end up being where this thing was. And there were several bushes around. Again, we didn't find nothing, absolutely nothing. So that was really strange. So, yeah, I mean, it's all, it did spark my interest. And I think the you know, most significant incident was uh, around about 90, 98, I think it was, when I was out and uh, I came home to, I don't know if you remember those old tape machines you used to get, a tiny little cassette yeah. tape. Yeah, I remember. Those things, yeah. I came in and little red lights flashing and uh, I got this call from this guy. Um, his, his name was Mr. Murphy, Alan Murphy. And he was absolutely... He, he really was scared on the phone. He's as if like he was, from what I can what I can gather is that he was ringing me, literally during an incident or just straight after an incident, and uh, because he, I could tell by his quick breathing and his panic in his voice, and he was trying to tell me about you know something that was going on uh, at the time, um, something to do with a UFO. He's a cattle hand. Uh, this thing has come down, and uh, and he had a very strong, very strong Irish accent, so it was a little bit hard to understand him fully. But I managed to pick it up. I thought, okay, this is interesting, and uh, luckily left his number, so I managed to give him a call the following day. And the story is, is basically he's a cattle hand, and he said he was working on a farm which was at that time called Adams Farm. Now. I don't know if the name of the farm was called Adam's Farm or the farm was called after the owner. You know, because it's very difficult there because you might have Mr. Williams. Some people call it Williams Farm, the locals, but it's actually called Henton Farm. You, are you with me? So it's, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, but the, the story is, you know, he's hired to basically stay at this location and uh, he looks after cattle, he's a cattle hand. And um, several nights, or four, four or five nights in the week or something, he stays there and makes sure that the, the cattle are okay and, uh, and everything's looked after. On this particular night, um, he was inside and, and he heard a, a litter of the cows not sounding right, you know, as if there was some, some big disturbance was going on. He initially thought, okay, well, he's probably a fox or something in the field that the cows don't like. You know, he's heard it before when a fox has been around. Uh, and he goes out, and to his shock, there's an object above the field, over the cows. Uh, and the cows are very, very skitty. They're kind of, I mean, to the point where they actually, <laughs> I remember him saying, they, they, they split, the, the cows split into, into two herds, and they just don't do that unless they're extremely scared, you know. And um, this thing was over them. And I was slowly descending towards them. Uh, and it cast quite a large light. And uh, he, as he said, oh, but Jesus, and he ran out there, you know, and he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's running and he's trying to get, the, he's got this big stick, he's trying to get the castle in and he's looking up and, and panicking. Uh, and then suddenly this thing starts to speed up and literally before you know it, it's literally on top of it. And uh, he's, he's, he said that it was only maybe six, ten foot above him. And that is extremely, extremely close. Um, he said he he, like, he looked up at it, but he couldn't see it properly because it was just so bright and very hot. Uh, and he, he thought, well, bugger the cows, you know, and he ran in for his life, you know. Would, yeah. Um, yeah. And so the first thing he does is, is he picks up the phone to the police station, which is at that time, it's Adlington Police Station. Now, Adlington Police Station, which is the local police station, is the – it's – it's only a kind of a temporary police station. It's only open, you know, a few days a week, you know, and uh, it's not that, the, and of course, you know, it gets truncated from Adlington Police Station through to the 8721010 number it used to be back then or something for the major police switchboard in Manchester. And uh, he's trying to explain to somebody, but luckily at the time, um, there was a, a few people associated with my organisation which were police officers, and uh, one of them was was a, a CID officer as well. It was also based in Manchester. Um, so he did made an effort whilst in the police force that to try and grab information from people that might be reporting UFOs and things like that. And 
my number was passed to him and he made that apparently made that phone call that night just after this incident um i asked him was the object still around um when i got to see him i, I asked him was the object still around when he rang and it wasn't um but he did say he was in the right panic now i rang him i rang him back on his number i uh, and talked with him and said look I need to I meet with you. I need to, you know, interview you, that sort of thing, you know. So where so can you give me, you know, directions, sort of thing. So I he gave me some directions. I said, okay, I'm gonna try and get up there for 12 noon tomorrow. And he said, No, don't come tomorrow because I'm not working at the farm tomorrow. But if you can come the day after and come about two o'clock in the afternoon, um, that'll be fine. So I said, fine, okay, no problem um i did get a phone call back a uh, day after that and uh he said can we change it from two o'clock in the afternoon to say i think it was like 10 o'clock in the morning i said yeah no problem and i went up there with a friend to find this location this farm and uh, meet with mr murphy and, and interview him um on the early it was early morning, it's about seven or eight o'clock when I received a phone call from him saying um, he was in a bit of a mess. Um, his face was burnt and um, he wasn't seeing properly out of one of his eyes. And he said, and a couple of guys had turned up the day after to see the farm owner. And I said, well, I just explain what do you mean? He says, well, I wasn't working the following day. But what happened was um, um, I was asked to go in because two guys in, in suits with no clear identification um, claiming to be uh, MAFF officials, that's Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Foods. Now, let's just take note of that because these are the guys that scare the living daylights out of farmers. And the reason by his, by, behind that is simply that within 24 hours, they can shut your farm down and they can find a multitude of reasons. This is not long or should we say around about, well, there wasn't much difference in time when we had all that foot and mouth stuff going on. The farmers were, you know, there was a lot of bad things happening. So they, of course they were very concerned. These two guys turned up in a dark, a black, dark, oh, some type of, dark car of a large large dark vehicle and uh, wanted to talk with mr murphy now mr wilson was the phone mark, phone at uh, the farm owner so it's interesting this is how i get to it's adam's farm but it's mr wilson that owns it yeah. you know and uh, they said to mr wilson apparently that uh, we wanted to talk with this this Mur murphy guy who's his catalog and he didn't know obviously what he was talking about you know all right okay well he's not working today so can you ask him to come in we want to talk with him he says yeah 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 it's not a problem i mean is there anything i can help and they wouldn't talk with mr wilson just asked him for his cooperation the guys waited until murphy turned up which was about 40 40 about 45 minutes or something like that later after after mr wilson uh, they contacted him he turns up the guys first the first thing the guys do is ask him about this mark on his face what is that? What's this mark on your face? And he said, uh, I got up with it. I don't, I don't know what it is. You know, and he didn't really want to get into anything. But he was a bit worried. Who these guys asking? Because there was clearly nobody else around that night when he saw this thing. And uh, they wanted to ask him about had he seen something in the sky? <laughs> and of course, him being so scared, and uh, he said, no. <laughs> no, 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 I don't, I don't know what he's talking about, sort of thing. He said, well, let me just tell you, uh, this is from what was said, um, let me just tell you that we're aware of your phone call to the police. And we're also aware of the organization you phoned. <laughs> so, and he was a bit, oh, all right, I can't mess with these guys, obviously. <laughs> I mean, you've got to consider this, that's just 48 hours after the incident, not quite 48 hours after the incident. How did he do that? And um, Mr. Wilson was a little bit upset about this. You know, he said, what is all this about? And he just basically said to him, you, you best cooperate with us. And he said it in such a way that he was concerned about, oh, bloody hell, I mean, what's going on here? And, you know, could they threat to shut me down or something? You know, yeah. now, 
they said to Mr. Murphy, he said, well, we need to take you away and, and, uh, and we've got some questions for you. And we're not too happy that, you know, you've got this mark on your face. You know, so, uh, you know, it'd be best if you come with us and uh, we'll take you home, you know, but we still have some more questions to ask you. And uh, they were forcefully enough to persuade him to get into the vehicle. And uh, unfortunately, that was the last time we saw Mr. Murphy. Um, I went up there and uh, I found the farm and uh, I went and approached the farm and I knocked on the door and some guy came out and said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. We haven't got a, anybody called, we don't know anybody called Murphy. And I hunted around that area, Chris, you know what? And it was the only one I could find that had cattle. The only one. I mean, I yeah. saw some cheaping and stuff and that, but I didn't come find any of this going back in 98. I couldn't. I was the only one I could see with cattle, and I said, surely this is the place, because from his directions, it's got to be. Anyway, I, I thought, well, if we've got it wrong, let's take a trip. Let's go and check out properly all the other farms. Now, there's only, what, a handful of them in the area, but I thought, well, what's the best thing to do is try and figure out where things are and what things are called, because there's a confusion between the farm name and the owner's name, you see. I don't know what he was referring to. Is there another farm somewhere? And that's called Adam's Farm, you know. And Adam's yeah. Farm. Um, and I, I talked to, I went to actually Adlington Police Station, and uh, I talked with them and said, "Look, you've got a guy who's disappeared, and <laughs> he's been in touch with me." Da 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 da. da. They said, "Well, you know what? We need to confirm there's a missing report. Are you a family member?" Uh, no. They said, "Okay." And they asked me a few questions, and then they said, "Okay. Well, you know what? We need to find out. You know, if there is a situation." At this moment in time, we don't know if there is. You know, they couldn't really do much. But I did ask them about the farms. And they said, yeah, it gets a bit complicated, the farm names. They actually admitted that themselves. said, the best thing to do is go up to the public house. There's a little public house up on the top of uh, uh, Winter Hill. And it's where all the locals go. And most of all, there's one person that goes into that place who knows everything. And that is the postwoman. There's a yeah. postwoman who goes in there, and she will tell you anything, any new place. She's been working this route for years. So we're headed off there, and I, actually, I went in there, and there's a postwoman sat there. Uh, obviously, she's still in uniform. I think she just goes in there after she's finished work or whatever, uh, and chit-chats. And I asked her, and she said, oh, yeah, she kind of pointed to the direction where I initially had come from. But this was unusual. So anyway, I decided to... We talked with the, another investigator I was with. We decided to do just a, one more run around the whole place just to see, uh, you know, where any other cattle might be held in any farms. And whilst we were going around, it was the only farm, actually, with cattle on, was that initial one we went to. But whilst we were going around, we realised we were being followed. Now, this isn't paranoia. You know, this is, we were being followed. and. Uh, I was guaranteed that I purposely thought, okay, I'm going to pull into this little car park. The vehicle pulls into the car park next to me. We thought, aye, aye, what's going on here? So this guy gets out and comes over and confronts us and says, what are you doing? I said, well, we're just driving around and, and look, we're trying to find a certain farm. I told him, you know, we're trying to find out him son. He said, well, we, you know, the locals around here don't like people coming around and nosing around and hanging around and stuff. They think you're up to no good. I said, why? Somebody made a complaint. And, and he wouldn't answer me. He just said, well, I don't think it's right, you know, to be going snooping around all these farms. You know, where are you from? So I said, well, I'm from Manchester. You know, and he said, well, you know, do you not think you're best on your way sort of thing? You know, they end up with the police around here before you know it. I question you because we've had problems on farms and things have gone missing and you're going to end up with a blame and this, that and the other. I thought, why is this guy on me? Who is he? And why did he follow us for, I mean, he was following us for quite some miles, backwards and round. Eventually, it's only when I pulled up, he confronted us. Well, if people watch the video, Steve, it is on the video. There's a shot of him, isn't there? You filming him. Yeah. Oh, I got a shot of him because I got the registration number. And like I say, there were people in my group, in my organisation, which were police officers. So I managed to find out who this guy was and who owned the vehicle. And lo and behold, you know, well, it's, I already double-checked on this because later, later on in the day, when we go back to Adam's farm <laughs> in Dart, um, we saw that vehicle parked there. So it had come from that farm. Ah, right. I don't know 
who he is. We did a vehicle vehicle check. We got this guy's name. Um, the the police officer said that basically he he was a gypsy or something. You know, he's not really. He's just, he looks for bits of second hand jobs and this that and the other. And I'm thinking, but why has he got this car? And he's there. You know, <laughs> it didn't make any sense. Yeah. So I was hot on this, and I thought, okay, well, you know, what? I'm not going to let this go too easily. Uh, because I want to know where Mr. Murphy is. So then eventually we got the address of Mr. Murphy just by doing analysis and help from some of our police officers that were part of the organization. And we went to the house and the house was vacant. The house we'd been left. And, and Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, he had his wife living with him. She seemingly had gone as well. We never actually found out what happened to Mr. Murphy and his wife. I assume they might have got relocated. <laughs> you know, maybe they got sent back to Ireland because they were very, very strong Irish, you know. So maybe that was the case. But I, I was determined and I've got to get some answers. And eventually I pushed and pushed and pushed Mr. Wilson to, com to confess. And he basically said, I know what about what he's seen. I know these guys don't want that information out. And I can't tell you anything. So it's because they've told me, if I talk to you guys, they'll shut me down. It's as simple as that. And we understood. I understood the situation. Um, he would not answer where the cattle went, though, because uh, he just wouldn't answer. He just shut the door because I asked him about the cattle. The, the cattle had gone. The cattle completely disappeared. And I think he must have had only probably about maybe 12, not that many. Um, but they just vanished. So we did research to try and find out uh, where these cattle had gone. Uh, the identification numbers of these cows from, uh, from this particular farm we never went through the market, never went through the slaughter market or resold. Um, we don't know what happened to those 12 animals. Um, they vanished. And they never, got, they never came back to the farm. Um, at that time, though, you know, we noted that this was at a time when the British aerospace was still active there. You know, yeah, just the on one, the... is it the Heapy one? Yes, that's yeah. right. And it's a stone throw. And maybe we were, we were trying to figure out, was this a test fly of something that they had? And, you know, uh, what really happened? And, and we never got any satisfactory uh, explanations. The, 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 the investigation ended up, I mean, if I sold you the case file, it's literally that thick. You know, it's just, just so. You, you, you did show it me, yeah. And there's a, there's yeah. there's tapes and files and all sorts in there. Oh my god, it was just so much. And the and the thing is, is that you know we we just didn't. They shut us down. Whoever was, whoever those two guys were, they shut it. They shut it down. And also, within 36, 48 hours, the their their resources must be incredible. Because this is an incident that took place in the middle of the night and nobody around on a farm. And yet, 36 hours later, or 48, they're there. They're, they're involved. Now, there's one piece of that investigation that I, I, I never really say because it's just stupid. But it happened. And that was when we were heading up there for the first time to try and get to the farm um and uh and meet with mr murphy is that i mean this is early morning um it must be around about maybe half past eight in the morning up, up there well this is at a time it was very foggy in the morning as well so we're there's only us up there when we're trying to locate this farm and I, I, I swear on my children's lives what went right past us is i'm sat in the car with another investigator and we're sat at a junction. It's foggy. And all of a sudden, a blacked out 1970s type old vehicle with blacked out windows, big black car, just drives past. And I looked at him and he looked at me and I said, you know, we can never, we can never say that now. You know, you never would ever, ever believe it. No. But up there, Around about half past eight in the morning was a black, like an old Cadillac or something, American, absolutely American, with blacked out windows as well. It was something, it was like what, in a film or something. I just couldn't believe my eyes. 
I don't know if we imagined it, but we both saw the damn thing come. I think we were we were just in gobsmacked. We just saw it just pass us, and it didn't. We sat there thinking, did we just see what we saw before we even thought about chasing <laughs> the damn thing? Anyway, we did, did did decide to try, and we just couldn't find it. It just where it got it just gone. And I don't know if that is just a really, really quirky, very extreme quirky incident that just by chance a black classic car with blacked out windows at half past eight in the morning should be well, should be driving through a foggy area of Winter Hill in the UK, close to this location. I mean, is that just weird or what? But we both saw it. and um, But we decided to keep it out of the report because it just... You know, you wear that and you think, ah, oh, forget it. You know, load of bloody rubbish. You know, <laughs> but it's true, and I, I don't, I will never understand that. Um, but the case ended up getting shelved because we just have no more information for it. I mean, we we put out for years. You know, if anybody's got more information, please come forward. You know, and we we got a lot of people coming forward saying, well, you know what, I've seen things up there in the sky. You know, um, and also heard of strange creatures, and you know, I know somebody saw something. I think we've had a lot of those stories, lots of them. It seems that seems to be a key location um, for numerous different activity, not just UFO, and not just cryptids actually. Because my last visit up there, well, it wasn't last visit up there, but my one particular visit which I did with my partner Jackie uh, was a beautiful summer's day. The last time you'd expect to ever see something unusual it was uh it was about tea time it was in the summer about maybe three years ago or so and uh, i decided to, to drive up there winter hill uh, up to the top near rivington pike because it's a beautiful beautiful view and on a really good clear day you can see blackpool tower to your right and on the left you can see even jodrell bank you know it's an amazing place and um i have done been up there a few times and seen a few strange things in the sky uh, and videoed them and, and photographed them occasionally, but this one was just so profound because, like I say, it's 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 lovely and warm. Um, it's a nice night, the sun's out, and uh, it's just nice and relaxing, you know. And uh, we spent we parked the car up, and we were up there for maybe about an hour, you know, and just and then we decided to head back, just nip out for now and get some air. Uh, so we jumped in the vi- into the car, my partner's car, and she's driving. And we're heading back down into that really bumpy. <laughs> she's only got a little car, bless her, but we're just bumping all over the place, sort of yeah, thing. It's still the same. It's worse now than it, than it was. Oh, is it? <laughs> well, we came to one little spot, and it was a small, you know, not the big vans, but the small vans that you don't see many very often, a white one. And it was a guy with the, the hood up, the, you know, on the engine hood, and he was in there doing something with it. So she wondered if he'd had problems or something. And we'd just passed him. And at that very point, something caught my eye. And I looked up. And what... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. And what I saw <laughs> was a woman. It looked like a woman. And she was flying. And she flew in across... across and, and I'm saying, what, she's 30 feet up off the ground flying horizontally very fast and with this old grey dress on which looked tatty and was blowing behind her he was because of the <laughs> travelling yeah. and she shot she came and shot behind this wall right next to this van and as I thought what the bloody hell and I looked and I saw these two white hands come up and then a head and she had this massive hair, black hair, complete white face, massive open black mouth, and big black, just voids, big black black voids. Didn't see any eyes, just black voids, open mouth, and really agape. And, and of course, Jackie's still driving. And I'm, still, I'm sat there thinking, and suddenly going to mind her. And I, and, and I don't know what happened because anybody who knows me would say, you know, well, we would have slammed the brakes on. I would, Steve would have been out of there. You know, I, I don't fear these things. I would have been straight out of the out of the car, running after this thing, trying to find out what the bloody hell it was. That's me. But 
it was like we had to get right down near the bottom of the road when suddenly I was allowed to react properly. And it's as if I kind of came to and I looked at Jackie and I said, did you just see something? <laughs> well, at that point, she slams the brakes on and she looks and she goes, oh, my God, tell me what you've just saw. I said, did you see a woman? And she went, oh, my God, did you see her face? Her? So she saw it. She saw the same thing I did. And yet she didn't and I didn't. Re we, we took it all in. Neither of us were allowed to act normally for a short period of time. Now, I've had this before in other incidents where you witness something and it doesn't allow you, it, you, can, you can experience it, but it doesn't allow you to, to act normally under the conditions until it says, okay, release, drum it, something. And I just couldn't, you know what? And I, 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 the first thing I did is I came home and she said to me, it's a banshee. I said, you don't get banshees in, do you have banshees in the UK? She says, I tell you. So what I did is, and you try guys at home, you type banshee in, because this is what I did. I type banshee in to Google, I pressed enter, and then I select images. Oh my God. It was like, I've seen the same thing. It was like white face, open mouth, black eye, big crazy hair. This thing flew in. Didn't hear any noise. I wonder if I thought afterwards, I thought, well, the hell's right next to this guy with his van, you know, yeah. I thought, what the hell? And, and do you know what? It just, it just doesn't make any sense. So I ended, up, I ended up bringing up a colleague, Barry Fitzgerald. He's in Ireland. He's a colleague of mine. Many know him. And I said to him, I've got one question. It might sound a bit crazy. He says, well, I said, do you get banshees in, in the UK? He says, of course you do. I said, you do? He said, yeah, it's not just in Ireland. I, I think I've seen one. <laughs> he asked me if I heard anything. I said, no, I have nothing to do with any Irish in my blood. I didn't hear anything, but I bloody saw this thing. And so did Jackie. And do you know what? We were absolutely no idea. What the hell was that? And this is Winter Hill. Again, it's as if it's some area which a strange weirdness happens. And uh, I think just being right there, right. Like I say, it's a beautiful sunny day. You know, not in the middle of the dark at night. It was a beautiful sunny day. Yeah. Didn't make any sense whatsoever to me. And typically, these things, banshees, aren't they sort of like considered a harbinger of doom or something like well, that? Yeah, this is what <laughs> this is what I was thinking. Is that what if this guy's Irish? I don't. I don't know what to make of it, Chris. But you know what? All I can say is, 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 is what I what I experienced and what I saw. Uh, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It really doesn't. Well, I mean, as you say, that that place. Even even recently, the researchers from the Winter Hill team, where Lee Roscoe and, and, and Mick McLaren and, and Carol Ann have been up there and experienced all sorts. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of sheep killings up there, and I think the right opposite the farm that you're talking about. I think Mick Mick McLaren received a report of, uh, I think it was like a silvery type craft, very low came out of, you know, the Tuckles Forest. Yes. It's opposite. Yeah. I think this craft either That's came cool. out of there or over there, and, the, and it was flying very, very low, and it was sort of like traversing, you know, mm. like traversing the land, following yeah. the, the, the shape of the land and the hills, and it just it went across the road. It was seen crossing the road, and it went off. Uh, yeah, it's but, a very... As you very say, you've got, British aer you've got British aerospace on, on one side of it, and then I think on the other side... That place, I can't remember the name. I think it's called Heapy, isn't it? Now, yeah. Man, Rich, is it Richard Hall? He, he did an investigation where he, they were at one time manufacturing bits for the uh, nuclear ignition systems, I think, weren't they? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, obviously, all that stuff was done separately at different, at different places, and it was top yeah. secret, obviously. But you can imagine that if that was something – let's say alien for, for want of a better word you can imagine why they might have an interest in in such a place yeah i think it was the fact that you know what led me to believe it might have been more ufo oriented is the fact that this thing seemingly had an interest in the cattle you yeah. know and was, and was approaching them you know it was uh it was, it was obviously something was i don't know if if murphy stopped what happened but um you know it was uh, as if that it was i had certainly had an interest in the cattle and you think that, you know, if that's the case, and these the cattle are making a hell of a noise, then 
you know, why why would you cause such a eruption? Wouldn't you want to do something which is a little bit less obvious? Because it seems like whoever piloted this, this object seemingly didn't care about what noise the cows are making and, and causing, you know, a bit of a stir out there. Um, it is interesting. You know, but the whole location is all a bit, a bit strange. I mean, I've traversed it a few times uh, on foot uh, years ago. And I remember, I remember uh, as far as I was looking, it was just field, a field. But somewhere along that field, it suddenly went down a grass embankment and it was a train track. And then it was a grass embankment on the other side. So if you're on either side of this, you don't even see it because it just kind of goes like this. And I remember standing on that train track and looking and it literally just went into the hill. And that was all filled up. It was all filled in. So I guess it was probably something to do with the old mining or something like that. Um, I tried to find it again, but I never did. But it was there, and it was there with others. And we were stood on those tracks, and we were thinking, well, where did these go to? They must, they must get a, get in. Well, if it's, if it is mines, they've got to get stuff out. So I guess the train track's perfect. But it was done in such a way that it's not visible to the naked eye on the landscape. Uh, so I tried to look on Google Maps, and I can't, I can't find it. Uh, it's all, it's a bit strange. But I remember stood on those tracks and seeing it. You know, it's, uh, it's 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 a stone throw from with the location, and it's you know it continues to generate reports on a regular basis. Yeah, um, it does. It does. And even Rivington Park is a little bit unusual because I've looked at it a number of times geologically, and I think to myself, is it really a natural? You know, I know <laughs> it doesn't look completely natural that Rivington Park area. Um, no, it's but, not. There's a lot of construction and all sorts of stuff going on, on up there, hasn't yeah, there? It's, it's, and then you've got the construction of the mast as well, opposite that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, again, and that's another reason why they could be interested in, you know, the mast is up there. Uh, I think yeah. there were some, were it World War Two, some, some sort of stuff going on up there, communication-wise, was 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 that the place where all... It's, it, it, it's like, as you say, geologically and geographically, it's an interesting location in itself. Yeah. It is. And, it, and there has to be something about the place to keep consistently producing phenomena because yeah. we've had, we've now, as far as I know, we've had banshees, uh, werewolves, Bigfoots, Burman, uh, a headless horseman, <laughs> big cats. I mean, is there anything left on the list? Maybe a vampire. I don't know. We'll give it time and that'll probably come up. Yeah. yeah. Uh I don't know. Well, I mean, it, it, it makes me think. I mean, there's a, as I mentioned earlier, Mick and, and Lee doing some really good work up there in and around uh, Winter Hill and as far as Wigan flashes. And that's another location that, I, and I think it's very similar to what's happening in a lot of places. Take Bempton as an example, where if there's no one on the ground 24 7 consistently mm. trying to do this type of research like you were doing back in the day. When these cases just get forgotten about, they either, I mean, it it's is. a little bit more fashionable than it was, but still, you know, people don't really want to divulge, do they? Not no, I mean, on their own. No, I mean, if you just look at I mean, there's only really one place you'll find a Winter Hill, many black case hours, I put it, the case I did, and that was on our own website, it was never anywhere else. Um, so it's very, a lot of those cases are very little known, you know, the, there's so much out there which is, deserves light of day and probably reinvestigation on many things but there's so much stuff out there you know just you know yeah good look i look through my filing cameras and i think yeah you know nobody's got that nobody's seen this you know um and it's like when i you know it's like when the whole rendlesham thing happened rendlesham forest incident in 1980 i didn't get really into it until around about who oh, was it, 84, 85 or something like that? I mean, I think it was just initially just had just come out and then I was on it, you know. And yeah. But I knew that numerous other people are going to be on it, you know, which will live probably a lot local to it than I do. Um, so I focused on the damaged areas of, of, of the, around the base of the, of the forest and, uh, and because I wanted to try and figure out what sort of storm that can happen there can snap a tree trunk a meter wide and then um, i haven't really found other storm damage to that degree 
Um, you can <laughs> see me from my younger days. Yeah. Um, but, and he, you know, it, it was, it was, it, I tell you, it was a very strange feeling being there because this is not, you know, this is after the incident took place, but when this storm hit the area and it, it was such a tremendous storm and it only, it was like a pin, it's like the, a pinprick from god because it just affected one location and nowhere other and that's what was so profound about this some people have even suggested it was a purpose targeted storm generated by some type of technology uh, and you ask the question well, why why would they do that well you know the whole area um the forest land was shut down nobody was allowed in or out and uh and of course, they, they even took the levels of, of, of dirt from the ground and took it away. They re sculptured the landscape, everything after that incident. I don't know if it's something to do with some of these objects coming down in the forest. Um, but you know what? It was just a no go zone. Nobody could go there and anything. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a fascinating place. Um, it, it, there's a photograph there to the right where that is the actual farmhouse. At the end, I don't know if you, when you hear the story about Rendlesham, there's a farmhouse at the end, uh, which looks over their field at the back where the, this object apparently supposed to have come down or manifested. And um, uh, I, I, I talked with the, the farm owner at the time, um, and I was just basically take, checking out, yeah, that's the, the farm. I was checking out the location, getting information, that sort of thing. I know that there were other investigators on there. So for me, I wanted to really do a deep, you know, ah, and there wasn't many who took the photographs and did the study on the damage for the trees. Yeah. And it was so profound. It was like walking through no man's land. I don't know if you ever see images of no man's land after the bombing. And it was it was like that. It was so surreal. And they, there was burn marks or something on the trees enough to have you know, taken up taken the bark off the tree on one particular side but there's two photos you see I'm, I'm photographing and videoing and suddenly there's two objects in the sky which i put in the images there um and there was two and then there was one now the the, the eternal i thought what are those two things in the sky not birds or anything well how the hell those things don't know what they were um, but one was a canister, kind of a canister shape with two prongs stuck out the side of it. <laughs> a canister shape with two prongs, which was just sat in the sky. And there was a something further up as well. And I managed to capture them on those photographs that I've sent over. Um, there's, there's two, but now what the canister one remained. It moved. It was slowly moving across the sky. Um, but it, it stayed there. For, for a duration, maybe about 10 minutes or something. The other one we lost sight of, which was, a, which was at a higher altitude, but that's canister-shaped one with these two prongs, just kind of just moving slowly, but around, kept in the vicinity for about maybe 10 minutes or something, and then it seemingly moved off. I don't know what the hell that was, but that was there when I was there. Um, and then it was later on, we went back in 1993, and we... There was, we came across a little, it was a little photograph. In this case, it was an object it was very bright. Um, but Rendlesham, that area of Rendlesham Forest is notorious for not just the paranormal and not just UFOs, but was mostly, initially, it was associated to cryptids, small men, small beings, gentry type encounters. And that's why you've got like small little villages called Elden or things like that. You know, it just, you think, well, why? Why are they called those funny names? It's because it goes back in time to all of these small cryptid sightings, which were taking place in that area before the you know, all the power no, normal stuff came along. Um, but there's always been a string of UFO stuff in that area long before the 1980s. Um, so again, we're looking at another location, which seemingly produces this type of phenomena. It's, Absolutely, it's, yeah. I mean, as you say, I mean, obviously you mentioned the Rendlesham Forest incident, and I think a, a, a lot of Americans, if there's any Americans watching this now or later on, uh, I think that people just think that that's, it, that's just the Rendlesham Forest incident and that's it. But there's stuff to this day going on in Rendlesham, and yeah. I, th I think you're right in what you're saying. I think it, the phenomenon was there before that. Oh, yeah. 
absolutely. And that's what makes that's what makes it very intriguing to me because you know you get such a big event like that, and then it seems to take place right on that location. You yeah. know, and you think to yourself, why do these? I mean, if we're dealing with some extraterrestrial source, and it's coming from some other planet, then why do they seem to pick these locations where other phenomena manifests? Because we, if if we truly, if we truly believe cryptids uh, and the power normal is an earthly phenomenon, then why is an extraterrestrial one seemingly be taking place in areas where those fake plants? It's just. Yeah. And if you look at right across the globe, it's the same thing. It, it can't be by chance, you know. There, there seems to be a connection, you know, one way or the other. Yeah, well, in regards to that, I think we better get through a couple of questions because I can see them piling up there. So Space Cadet Lottie's asking, has Steve ever investigated a case or a report involving little people, fair or elemental type beings? Oh, yeah, a few, a few. Uh, some of them were a little bit dodgy. I have to say, um, and I had no problems telling people afterwards because I always said, you know what, if you're going to involve me and I'm going to travel at my expense and come all the way down and it turns out that it's a bloody fake, I will, you know what, I'll tell people, do you really want me to come down? I know sometimes you know, the odd person said, no, you don't, you know, but then some people have done been daft enough to do so and I found out it's to be a bit dodgy and I, and I just say, you know, dodgy you know but then there are some things which do uh, have been reported and i and i've seen a few photographs as well in my time which i can't explain and i can only i can only perceive it to be something associated to the moment that happened and sometimes it's a close connection between the individual the observer themselves are somehow tied with into the event there's certainly key areas across the country where those type of things are seen more uh, in given areas, and it usually leaves a historical trait behind. You know, if you start researching, you'll find that there's older, kind of older connections to this phenomenon, uh, and people do report them. Hey, if I can see a bloody banshee, <laughs> and you know, I'm never going to rule out. I will never, rule, honestly, I will never ever say to somebody, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I don't believe you at face value, and I can't do. You know, because uh, I've seen things myself, and I, I just think to myself, you know, well, you know, I didn't see it on my own. Uh, so therefore, anything can go. But yeah, it's, it's what our, my argument's always been is that you know, truly, are we witnessing all these thousands of different types of anomalies, or are we are we experiencing one source that can create a multitude of phenomena, or, or, or perceive it to be? Um, I would rather go with the latter. The latter has a better understanding to me and a layout and a pattern in regarding conformity to the perception in other words how you might perceive this phenomenon you know just because it looks different doesn't mean that it's a different phenomena you know we might be dealing with something that uh, has traits in in being able to perceive or get people to perceive it to be different things that's seemingly always been the case through the historical documents but yes i've done quite a few of those cases and some of them i say I say there's more of them dodgy than they are real, I would say, but definitely some of them, some of them are a bit strange and out there. Yeah, absolutely. What about, that's just reminded me when we, we went, I can't remember where we were going now, but we would, and you mentioned about those little ninjas. What's that here? <laughs> I know it's a strange one, but I don't know whether people have heard this. But strangest thing. Um, it was a case that took place in Cheadle near Stockport in the UK. And it's not actually too far from Bolton. It's probably about, I'd say, a 30 to 35 minute drive. And um, it took place in Adley Hall. Uh, and it's a small area park in Cheadle. And uh, it's best known for Agatha Christie, um, who stayed there because I think her brother was uh, owned owned it at one time, this, at this hall, Abney, Abney Hall. And um, it's an old, it's an old Gothic building, and do you know what? It's tremendously looking, huge gargoyles all over it with with devil faces and stuff. It's a wonderful place to see. Um, and in the eighties, uh, during the summer, this incident occurred, which is so profound. Nobody I know has ever looked into this case has ever come up with any satisfactory explanation. And it was a beautiful summer's day, and the local karate team had decided to have a karate display 
Now, this is all for the young kids, you know, they're all nines and tens, 11, 12s. Uh, and then allow the parents to come and see this display that they're going to do on the grounds of Abney Hall. It's actually on, on the, at the back of it. There's a small uh, garden area and grass. And apparently everything went well. You know, quite a number of people turned up to watch their sons and daughters, you know, give it all this sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, then there was about there was about three or four different instructors there, <clears throat> and uh, apparently what happened was it started off with um, there's a number of bushes on that on the perimeter of the of the back uh, lawn, and there was sounds coming from it as if kids were in it, you know, and and shaking the bush and making some strange noises and stuff. Um, so one of the instructors went over to the bush thinking obviously some kids from locally are in there and the you know they're, they're having a laugh sort of thing so he thought he'd go over there and just say hey get out of there and clear off sort of thing and you know he, he approached it he could see the bush moving and stuff and literally opened the bush out and there was nothing in there and he thought it was a bit strange but while he's doing that apparently it's happening on the other side and another instructor catches eye of something seemingly dark and small rushing into the bush again he thinks it's a small child uh, and he did exactly the same thing. He pursued it, opened the book, nothing there. And then all of a sudden, it's as if all hell broke loose, just sort of a snap of a finger. All of a sudden, what happened was one of the girls, uh, one of the one of the the children who were on the karate, doing the karate, she he had a, a young lad had a, an older sister with her mum and dad there to come to watch. And she'd come along with her boyfriend, and all of a sudden she violently just goes absolutely crazy screaming and attacks, physically attacks her boyfriend. And she's leathering the hell out of him. She's, she's whacking him and she's on the floor and she's pulling his hair. And, and people actually have to drag her, drag her off him. Whilst that's happening, uh, these other skirmishes suddenly outbreak, and suddenly these, these black small things start to be seen there's about five of these things and they're all dressed this is how they described them they're all dressed in what looked to be like a ninja suit but they're all <laughs> but they're all dwarves they were ninja <laughs> ninja dwarves <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't go even go there and they were there was something about these things because it's as if people couldn't control their actions. And it was quite serious, Chris. I mean, what happened was, is even one of the instructors themselves, the small stream at the back, was, was seen trying to drown himself. He had to be dragged out of it. He didn't know what he was doing, but he was trying to drown himself in a little stream at the back. Literally all the people, parents, had to drag him out. Uh, there, there were police called. There was even ambulances apparently attended the scene. Uh, these things were also seen to be hovering occasionally. You could see that they could jump quite high, but they'd, they'd also hover. And uh, uh, it was like, uh, it was like all of a sudden, it's like 15 people were kicking off at each other for no apparent reason. Strangers attacking each other, just complete chaos madness. And it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But here's the interesting stuff. There is evidence to support it. And I was there, uh, I put out some information when I first covered this case, and uh, I, went, I was surprised to get, alarmingly surprised, to get responses back from people who lived in that location at that time and were telling me they were aware of this. People who said they saw these things. People who said, I, I was going through on my bike one night and these things came out and they pursued me. They were definitely unearthly. So I was there, maybe one was about now, uh, about four months ago. I decided to take a trip down there and take some new photographs and stuff. And uh, and I'm walking through, and I suddenly, this elderly woman walking the dog walks up and says, you know, oh, are you taking photographs of the hall and stuff? I said, yeah. I said, you know, it's a whole, old, looks an old building. She said, you know, it's only open up once a year, only once a year. And if you want to go inside, you have to make an appointment because I've been in once and it, and it's very haunted, she's telling me. And I said, oh, well, I can probably imagine something like that. 
And she said, oh, yeah. I said, so, so started asking her about, do you remember back in the sort of mid-80s? I said, there was a spate of these, she said, little black people, little black dwarf people, you know, ninja white. I said, I said yeah, she said, you know about that? She said, oh, God, yeah. She said, you know what? I've lived down, I've lived down there for, 60, for like 65 years. I said, have you? She said, yeah. I said, I, I know all about that. So uh, they were seen. I said, and people still report. I walk my dog around here on a regular basis, and I'm always seeing people who tell me occasionally they see these things and hear these things. And I said, so they're, they're still around even now, occasionally. Nobody knows what they are. And I said, oh, right. But then she went on to tell me this really fascinating story, literally a mile away, um, where is, where is, a, is a, a place where you can go horse riding. And she said, when I was young, I used to take people horse riding. Now, what we also did is, is take little kids out, but we had to walk with the horse while they were riding. Well, they, you know, so we take them on a set path every single day. We take them down the road, down to the towards the stile, and up by a farm. Turn around this, turn around by after the farm, and come back. And that was our route. And it was three of us. I had two of the friends that worked with me did, doing taking the kids. So I said, oh, I said, okay. She said, well, uh, one day we all realised that we got down to this road where the farm is further down. When we go past the farm, turn around, come back. Go out the front of this road, the horse would not would not go any further. I tried pulling it and it just would not. And I couldn't, I was scared because, you know, it might buck up and, you know, you got a little kitty on it. I said, yeah. well, okay, all right, you don't want to go down there. And she, it was the first time it ever happened. So she comes back, and she's sat having a little break, and then she's got a couple of other friends that do the same thing, work there, um, with these part-time jobs. And she says to her friends, she said, and they all, they all say the same thing. said, well, we've got the horses down there, and none of them, not one of them will go down that road. So she just doesn't understand this. So she says, okay, all right, well, I'll check this out. So on that Saturday, she decides to take a walk down there, and it's a little bit different because when she gets down there, she realises that the farmhouse doesn't seem to be any activity there anymore. There used to be, you know, there used to be some sheep and there used to be, you know, you could see activity there. And there was nothing. And there's another couple of houses on that show. So she decides to go down and talk to one of these guys. He's got, there's only two cottages in the farm. So she talks to this guy that lives in this cottage. And he said, well, between us... He said, about a week or so ago, something came down in that field across the way in that farm field, and it left a circular mark in the grass. And the, and we literally within hours, it was there was all sorts of people there, military, you name it. And the family got they they, they went off in a van. They took everybody. They had to take belongings. I saw them taking stuff out of the house, and they were gone. But they stayed on that farm, these military, for about a day, an extra, an extra day or two, uh, because this affected area. And they cleared it all up and da-da-da-da-da. And she couldn't believe it. Yeah, so she goes, she's, okay, because she's trying to tell this guy, well, you know, that was a lot too long ago when I was trying to get down here with the horses, horses won't come. So they started talking with each other. So she's thinking, I wonder if the horse has said something, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so she goes over to the farm. And she's, she's, she's looking over this gate and she's looking at this field. And she said, you know what? I could see the round mark. I could still see the round mark. It was about 60 foot in size. And it was a perfect circle. And I said, that's, I said oh, wow, that's interesting. I said, it's one of those things that wouldn't you wish to be found out that something at the time when you know you'd ever do. You know, and I said, that's a crazy. She said, you know what? Crazy is, is, is not the word. I mean, I went from that, and now I, and now I see and hear all about these things in Abney Hall, Abney Hall Park. And she said, and I'm not the only one. She said, there's loads of people I talk to which walk the dogs. And we see them each other, you know, each other nearly every other day. I said, and they're always telling us, you know, oh, I saw this and heard that. So it's Abney Hall. It's in Cheadle. Uh, it's a small park in Cheadle. Um, you can Google Abney Hall. You have some great images of it. It's very gothic looking. But the amount of people came forward and said they witnessed this, they remember this, you know, and people were really injured. 
what the hell that was uh, and whatever these things are i don't know i really don't i have no explanation but it sounds too crazy to believe to be honest with you but you know what can all these people be lying just keeping a legend a myth going i don't think so there's too many people involved with various ages and backgrounds for something like this to have just be made up it can't be there's got to be more to it than that and uh, and even now occasionally i get reports of some strange things going on there it's just those wacky ones yeah so when like ufologically when was it was the paranormal first or was it ufology first for you for me uh it was ufos i mean uh, 1983 was my first case in liverpool of a a family witnessed um, a ufo in the sky i interviewed them (laughs) back then just over one of those big tape recorders my kit pair binoculars, big tape recorder, you you know, little microphone that plugs in, nice. um, and a compass, a pad and pen, that was it. Hey, that was his kit back then in 83. Uh, first interviewed them about a UFO that was seen in the sky. And um, for me, I stayed in ufology until, I mean, I was voracious, to be honest with you. I mean, I got into the subject so quickly and voraciously that I literally read exhausted Central Library in Manchester. Literally, you know, there's nothing I could learn from any more there. And I, I joined a number of organisations, had a few mentors, um, and uh, they set me on the path and did a few courses and I learned a lot of stuff. But then I, eventually I felt I'd exhausted the subject of ufology because it didn't make sense. It was missing something, didn't make any sense whatsoever. I was never happy with the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and I'm glad to say so, because now we're slowly moving away from that uh, to some degree. Um, And then I kind of, after about 10 years or something, I got into the paranormal uh, very heavily. I mean, uh, supernatural, uh, paranormal, um, the metaphysical stuff, and then I got into the parapsychological stuff because I realized very much so that a lot of this, you know, might be associated to a uh, psychologically um, something to do with us ourselves, and you know, how we observe it, perceive it, that sort of thing. I needed to know what's our brains doing at the time, so, so I ended up having to study lots of parapsychological stuff. I did several courses in that, and then. I, what I did is I suddenly realised that the paranormal, there's paranormal attributes, the metaphysical attributes to UFOs. And I thought, well, what happens if you put all these in the same pot? Quite an interesting cocktail. When you start to do that, you start to deliver some answers towards some of the ufological stuff. I never thought about then to do this, to introduce paranormal and metaphysical, supernatural, spiritual stuff to the the UFO stuff, because my mentors and all the books I was reading at the time were saying, hard fact, these are aliens, extraterrestrials, traveling to planet Earth in physical nuts and bolts craft with some type of exotic engines that can go faster than the speed of light, and they're traveling the vast distances of space to come here. And I thought, well, okay, well, if that is the case then, you know, we should see, formulate a pattern. But then when you look at the reports, you think, hang on a second, this is so paranormally orientated or metaphysically orientated. Why? Why should it be if these are an extraterrestrial source coming in? And I thought, hang on, something doesn't add up here. And there were limitations and compartmentalization. Now, that compartmentalization might have been done on purpose, to be honest with you, just to keep us from stopping putting all the pieces together and generating some type of image, working out what's going on. Because I never would deal with the power. It happens all the time. Paranormal guys don't deal with the UFO guys. UFO guys don't deal with the Ghostbuster guys, you know. But there's a lot more to it than that. And when you start to apply what I refer to as those profound physics, you start to come up with answers to, okay, well, this is a UFO case. But it's got incidents of poltergeist-type phenomena, metaphysical interactions. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, let's let's call it for what it is. You know, we don't, everybody loves terminologies. And the problem is with terminologies is, is it gets buried. It gets conf- really problematic. It's like saying haunting, but haunting consists of so much. 
So I thought to myself, apply the different areas to one thing called phenomenology, and then start looking at what the conclusions are. And it found, I found that it was leading me more towards a probable source of conclusion than it was to ignore the paranormal metaphysical stuff from the UFO cases. And then suddenly, it was like one day, there was a light bulb moment, boom. And that was when uh, we had a poltergeist case in Morecambe. We were investigating, and there were some prolific apportations taking place. And one of those apports, we took it away and had it analysed, and we had it broken down and, and crushed up to put under, under three forms of microscopy, atomic microscopy, which looks at the the very atoms of it, you know, of the of, this obj of the object. And we had a bench test against it. And we had a sample, so there were two. It was actually a mug, uh, but we had the apported mug and another mug and we both were bought at the same time in the same pack so you know they both looked the same and felt the same and weighed the same but under the microscope they have this referred it's called it's like a scale effect and the computer program with all the details from analysis between the non-apported mug and the apported mug said that the apported mug was not <laughs> was more likely not to be the mug that he was before. So I was trying to figure out what the hell does that mean? Does that mean that the apported mug, it disappears, and then it suddenly sort of reappears, maybe in a slightly different location? But is it the mug at left? Has that mug been altered or mimicked in some way, M manufactured from some other reality? You know, the evidence will support that it's not the same mug at left. But yet it weighs to us, just holding it, picking it up, you would not tell the difference between the two. Under analysis, it does. Um, and the last time we saw, and they gave us this report on the diathermic reactions within this mug, was incredible. But we knew it's, I knew I'd seen these diathermic reactions before and I couldn't quite place it. I was looking at all the paranormal cases of other things, diathermic reactions. And eventually I found it, and it was in a it was in a UFO case, not a paranormal. It's looking completely different draw. Eventually I'm going through it and I find it. And it took ages, I knew I had it. And it turned out is a, a UFO came was seen to manifest close to the ground. And it affected the plants on the ground. That was trace evidence that was left on the UFO incident. Professionals came along researchers and took samples took parts of the plant and away to analyze and analyze and it was referred to as plant biological traumatology report in there was a listing of the diathermic reaction on the plant and the diathermic reaction in the plant was the same time as diathermic reaction we saw in the mug so kind of looking at these two things saying that's the ufo case that's a paranormal case and yet the materialization process of these, and this di may it be referenced to this diathermic reaction, which suggests that if it's a mug that suddenly appears, or it's a UFO that suddenly appears, the physics involved in the manifestation of them might be the same physics. It's the same source. That led me to believe that, okay, we're dealing with a source now, uh, probably associated with both. And then what I found out several months ago was that there was a, an AI computer jet made an AI computer it was first tried to be manufactured with um, with uh, Jacques Vallée tried but there was a later one done and once it was created they, they loaded it with all these wonderful stories like I've been telling you all these fascinating cases and and the meta the, the tributes to the to the mechanics of it and it they ploughed their sin to about four years. And then eventually, they pressed this button expecting this AI to come up. Okay, I'm going to work it all out of all the information that you've given me over four years, and I'm going to tell you what it is, what the conclusion is. <laughs> People thought, oh, I'm going to say God and things like that. But it was really interesting, actually. The result from this, this AI, artificial intelligence, after all this information was put into it, it said... It said it. What did it say? Now it said it was a believed to be a singular source with the capabilities of creating 
um, oh, what was it now? Uh, uh, physiological constructs was the word. A single source capable of creating physiological constructs. A physiological construct. I kept thinking about that. What does that mean? And I thought to myself, well, that could mean anything. That could mean be a physical construct of a, a, a Bigfoot, a physical construct yeah, of like yeah. an, an apparition, uh, a strange creature. It, 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 that's a physiological construct. In other words, they are at present physiologically there and can affect the environment and affect the individuals within it. But it's a construct and there's a singular source. Because of all the information it led back, it saw so many connections between all this phenomena, it, it, it could only come up with, is a singular source responsible? And the big question is, what's that singular source? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we better get some questions, Steve, and there's, uh, there's another one from uh, Spurs Cadet Lottie, and she's asking, what is the most peculiar case Steve has investigated, recent or historical? A disappearance. Does it, does it get more peculiar than the ninjas? Yeah, there is one actually. There's one. I mean, I, I I couldn't. I don't even know why they contacted me in the first place. Southampton Police contacted me. I had a sit down meeting with them in a cafe of all places. And he presented this report. Wanted to ask me about disappearing people. This is long before four one one and Dave Pilates. This is well back. Um, and in Southampton. Um, there was a gentleman who was married, had, had a young child, only a few months old, little boy. Also got promoted at work, got a new Rover, new green Rover the vehicle, and uh, was ditchuffed about that. And on Friday nights, he'd go out with his friends. Well, he was this particular Friday night. He was definitely wanted to, but wanted to go out in his car, wanted to show his friends his new, his new company car. Very happy family. Like I said, just had a three-month-old child doing good in business. Comes uh, so he comes home from work. He tells his wife he's going out that night in the car. You know, he's with some friends. Uh, so he has his tea, goes upstairs to get changed, and his wife realizes after some time passed. I don't recall him saying goodbye. So she stands at the bottom of the stairs and shouts up, and he's, he didn't answer. So she thought, well, "That's a bit weird. He, why would he go out and not say goodbye?" And so she looks out the window. His car's still there. So she thinks. So she shouts upstairs again, nothing. So she eventually she does go upstairs and finds that his keys are on the side, but there's no sign of him. In fact, she was going around looking for him, saying, if you jump out on me, you bugger, I'll kill you, you know, because thinking <laughs> yeah. he's down. He wasn't in the house. And this is so weird because the police were eventually called in a day or two later. Um, and uh, filing a missing persons file was report, but they were there were so many problems. They were trying to figure out. Even CID got involved because they thinking after a period of time had gone by that he was done in, or they wanted to question: Did he have reasons to trying to work out and, and analyze? Was there a reason for him to disappear? The proper analyst said no. There was absolutely nothing. Um, had he been done in, was there a crime committed? They were more likely to blame his wife yeah. of doing something untoward than trying to figure out an explanation It's a bit strange. And uh, he was gone for quite some time, uh, to the point where she actually moved in a, a family member. She was that distraught. She couldn't understand what had happened. And uh, I think it was a few, some, some weeks later, um, she was downstairs in the kitchen with family when she heard a thud come from upstairs. So she went to the bottom of the stairs and shouted up, you know, he was up there, so he was up there. And uh, her husband's voice bellowed back saying, it's me, you know, it's me. And she couldn't believe it. She just could not believe it. She went flying up the stairs, she rushes into the bedroom and finds her husband stood there with this perplexed look on his face and she just throws her arms around him, sobbing. Abs and he's like, clueless. Oh, what, what's, what's wrong? And she's trying to explain to him through the sobbing that you'd been gone for ages and you disappeared. Where have you been? And, and he hasn't. He says she thinks he's, she's joking because she, as far as he's concerned, he went upstairs to get changed, ready to go out that night, puts his keys down, and then she shouts him. And he says, it's me. And then she comes running up, flings her arms around. He just, 
He thinks he's having a breakdown. He thinks he must be something. Is he a tumour in the head? What the hell? He just and it, it's proven to him that he's been gone all this time because showed family have shown him newspapers and stuff. The police have been reported. They come round and question him. He couldn't didn't know what to tell him. And they, they actually were going to charge her and the family as some prank, as some joke. Yeah. And uh, but it never actually went through because they couldn't really find enough evidence. They had to find evidence to, to support the prank. And it was the only feasible thing they suggested, but they did make warnings to them, written warnings to them, you know, that you've wasted valuable police time and all this, that, and the other. And, and the police were very on guard about this then because they're thinking, what the hell's all this about? And uh, he he was that he was that convinced something's wrong with him. He'd, booked, he'd been in touch with doctors and got himself booked into the hospital to have one of these brain scans, CT scans. Um, but his wife is saying, well, you can't just disappear for three weeks. Where did you go? He says, well, maybe I'd, I walked out and I don't remember. She says, well, why are you wearing the same clothes? <laughs> well, that would be because I don't remember where they've been. You know, maybe I've been walking around the streets or something. <laughs> I don't, just didn't yeah. make any sense. Did not make <laughs> any sense. Now, what happened, he never actually made that appointment at the hospital. Because some some time later, not too long as well, so it was only a matter of a few weeks again, that he was upstairs and his wife was downstairs and she had a funny feeling and she just had this, I don't know, this gut instinct, intuition to walk to the bottom of the stairs and shout up. And as she thought, she didn't get a reply. And she flung up, flew up those stairs. And again, gone. Uh, no sign of him. No sign of him changing clothes. Nothing. Just gone. Vanished. Not in the house. And of course, the, the police were called again. And of course, <laughs> you know, it was all hell broke loose. And I got photographs and document. I'm just I'm reading all this, you know. And I said, you know, they tried to find out from me, you know, are there any disappearances, strange disappearances? I said, yes, there are. There are profound disappearances. There have been a few profound appearances as well, believe it or not. It wasn't that long ago when there was a, a guy in a tuxedo turned up in the UK from out of time, literally. You know, this was just 100 and odd years ago, but he was wearing some type of concert-type gear, as if he was some type of conductor. He didn't speak a word of any language whatsoever, and but he was an absolute genius on the piano and things. Uh, and he ended up being, you know, being mental, you know, being taken away to a mental hospital and that sort of thing. Um, but he was just no explanation where he come from. He just seemed to appear in the middle of a road. So I explained to him, there are some strange cases. There are people, there's a very well-known case in the 70s where three joggers were running. One of them fell, fell over. And as the two turned around, they just saw, literally saw him vanish. You know, there was a very interesting report about that. Um, again, there was no no conclusion met on that, and the police didn't think any foul play had happened. And I said, yeah, there are some cases like this. He said, well, you know, how do you resolve them? How do we resolve them? I said, no, well, we, don't. I said <laughs> we don't. I don't know what type of answer he was trying to get from me, this sergeant. I said, I, we don't. We, we, we don't have all the answers. Uh, and what happened was is that um, she was expecting him to turn up again about three weeks later, again, she's distraught, got a family around. And he never did. He never did. And to this day, he never came back. And this was, his, his three-month-old child would be probably around about 17 now, you know? But what's really interesting is that she didn't work. And um, she was so adamant that she would never leave the house. It was her family had to help purchase the house for her. And she still lives there today, hoping, praying that one day she'll hear that thud and her husband will turn up. Um, but she's still there now, as far as I'm aware, according to the reports and stuff. And I checked up again about it maybe about five years ago or stuff, and there was no change. She was still there, and he hadn't returned. And I don't know what the police wanted me to, to say. Maybe it a path of investigation or a method of doing something. You know, I didn't have a clue how to provide him anything that might help warrant you know, better judging from the case. But it was certainly interesting to find out that this case was shelved and remains shelved to this day. It's not, uh, it's not been concluded. It's one of those so weird it's ones. Still on, it's an active case, do you think? 
it's a, it's a shelled case, as they said to me. In other words, it's it's not active, but it's not it's not been terminated. You know, it's still uh, yeah, it's not been closed. Uh, I would say that's probably the most profound thing. And did, though I didn't have to do much of the early investigation, it is probably the most profound thing I've come across. Mm, it is. Yeah, I remember working on the video. It's fascinating account. Uh, yeah. Tino, I say no. Tino's asking Steve, have you invest? Have you investigated Stocksbridge Bypass, or would yes. you consider doing so? We have actually the best report on the Stockbridge Bypass. I could actually put that out there. Uh, in fact, it's on the Mappet website. If you go to um, um, Mappet.org, you'll find under Investigations Stocksbridge um, incident, and we thoroughly investigated it on behalf of the council and several other parties and it turned out everything was fake everything was inaccuracies uh, lies and fake information though that there have been people that said they've gone up there in groups and said oh they've seen this that and the other there's not enough evidence to support that um but uh, we even we even had that bypass closed so we could take proper measurements <laughs> and we went at a time when there was no traffic whatsoever so we could play, take proper measurements and angle angular of light from the police vehicles um being able to because they said in their report that their beams of lights from the headlights lit up the figure on the bypass that was a lie you know we know from the angular of the vehicle and that it was absolutely impossible to do so and it was just one problem after the other even the police reports regarding this figure appeared next to us um uh, on the car sort of thing and his body was up close and all those sort of things when we, we went through all the sightings and the descriptions which didn't add up you know the clothing which was not period to that time and you know there was lots of things saying it was a monk when he obviously it wasn't a monk and we were just so many problems there's a very look on the if you go to our website map it.org you and go to the, the you know the the Stotsbridge bypass case uh, there's myself and another in, uh, a, a brilliant investigator cursed the raven um and we we worked on that case thoroughly for quite a long time and what we actually got was proper scientific data basically to say you know what at least 90 percent of what we were being told and the information and the police reports and stuff just did not add up nothing you know there was so many problems with it uh, eventually we had to conclude that it, uh, there wasn't enough information to support it mm. uh next question please Lorraine. <clears throat> What's this in relation to, uh, Paul? What do you think is uh, most likely? Oh, right, okay. What do you think is most likely, aliens, cryptids, or ghosts? The most likely? Do you mean, uh, I would say... Uh, all is it. that in relation to a particular case, or is that a, in, in, in general, Paul? You just put it in comment. If it, if it's just in general, Matt, just type it. Just just put generally in the in the. Yeah, comment. I mean, if you're asking, you know, what's the most likely out of those three? I said, oh, well, this there's no there's evidence for all three of them. But that's you know what I hate the name alien, you know, because what makes an alien alien? Because it doesn't look human, but we have other things that don't look human. We don't call them aliens. So it's a hypothesis. The thing, you know, um, people have reported seeing what looks to be what they think is an alien figure and yet it seems to change its shape or manipulate its perception in some way to alter its state of how it looks to become something else there are people have reported you know um uh, giant rabbits and things like that and it turned out not to be them <laughs> you know we're messed with our perceptions and i think you know even the paranormal can do that you know it's very very hard to work out but I would say there's, there's evidence. I don't know. I wouldn't call them alien. I call them something else. But I've said there's evidence for all of those. There is enough evidence to support that there is something in existence. What do you, Steve? I, I know we talked about we talk about this endlessly at work. Like, but the cryptid alien type. I say alien. I know you don't like the word, but we'll use it as a reference. The the alien hypothesis and the cryptid. Uh, are often this is this is becoming quite a popular concept that these dogmen type creatures, not necessarily the Bigfoots, uh, that these dogmen are alien. 
type. The, the, these are these are from off world. Well, it's interesting you say that because the first accounts come from ancient times. Yeah, and uh, I mean they were actually wrote up as that they were dog headed people, real dog headed people, like a clan, like we're living, and they had their own location to live in away from the other societies because they were different. And they go into great details about how they lived, what they ate. They even traded with them. There's documentation, ancient documentation. They said they even made trade. How do we even fathom that out then? That means then that something was around that they believed was a, had dog head, a dog-headed human or humanoids. It, it's, it's weird. And it doesn't make any sense. But you think, okay, well, if it's a fantasy, a story, a legend, we wouldn't expect to see it again. Wrong. We see it again and again and again. And right through ancient Roman, ancient times, it's crept through. Right through to uh, through these Roman times, through to Egyptian times. We've got dog-headed you know, people, individuals seen, represented within the Egyptian period. And even right through into medieval times, when dog-headed creatures were being seen, proper reports were made out about them, police details about them, these were seen and experienced. And even now, in current day, we still do. So there's a trait of this. It goes back. Now, fundamentally, was there a real living creature with dog head? Well, according to more than one ancient civilization that talks to the same thing, um, one is that they they kept they were they were they kept themselves to themselves. They lived away from them, but occasionally they would trade, and these were dog headed people. Um, they were humanoid looking, but except for the dog head, and uh, they were very voracious, and they didn't want to intermeddle with them, sort of thing. So they made sure that their that their society was kept well away from everybody else's. And there's another civilization, ancient civilization, that actually built a location for dog headed people. You know, they actually they, they actually built a place for them and interacted with them. And you think, hang on a sec, these are on the other side of the world in different places. How did he know this? You know, did he both one thing you have to look at is the ancient documentation of these things. There seems to be fundamentally something going on where people believe they've seen physical creatures with dog heads. Uh, and you know what? You can talk to people in current times which will swear, which will swear to you they've seen the same thing in modern day. Uh, and you know we rely on our senses to tell us what's real and what's not real the problem is is that when we live amongst a reality that's not real in the first place what we <laughs> judge it against what are we judging it against what people don't realize is that we're not living in a reality that is real in a sense of speaking we are living in their reality the same reality we share with them and they have done and we will do forever i always assume and i probably always have that's the playground which is our reality not this is real and you're not you know i mean we've got to consider that you know even we might be the new kids on the block and it's their reality in a sense of speaking but one thing is for sure um the reality that we know brings these two things together in modern times and in ancient times but yes i do believe there's enough evidence to say that some physical creatures of that nature once lived yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I, I was discussing this with Paul Sinclair a few months ago, and we were talking about that the, the, the dogman-type cases do appear to be a little bit more uh, sort of negative, uh, and, and that often the, the these creatures or these beings will come upon a witness as opposed to the witness stumbling upon them. That seems mm. to be the one difference. Uh, there are a few cases where you've got the old red eyes, when <laughs> we've talked about that before, which is almost like a, a paranormal supernatural trait, yeah. the red eyes. Absolutely. Almost like a giveaway, a bit like the Mothman, uh, yeah. the Owlman. Uh, and, and oh, yeah, that is a trait. I mean, the, the self-illuminous eyes is, a, is certainly a trait even through the Skinwalker um, reports and stuff. Uh, and Lizardman, and, and, uh, and even in East Country, the Owlman, of course, the famous Welsh, the Owlman. Um, they do have um, some type of similar connection there. And what is interesting, you are about when you mention about these negative traits, you know, the, yet yeah, you are right. Um, they do happen in certain key areas where there are negative um, magnetic regions. 
Um, it also happens to people who have had trauma in their lives. You know, there's uh, there's a fundamental part for people who um, are experienced, grow up to be experiencers, and that is people of a certain type who have gone through trauma or you know some problems in the life. Um, because phenomena, negative phenomena is attracting to those things and it becomes, it leaves a little piece with us um, for us to experience it from now on uh, again and again. And it's, it's it, 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 and no proper feasible analysis is done on this and it is required, I keep saying on a psychological basis, that a proper analysis is required, statistical analysis, uh, to find out more about this because there seems to be certain traits with you know that within certain people and their lives uh, and it can pass through families uh, but there are negative things associated to those encounters um that's problematic you know a lot of people have had other experiences as well often see cryptids you know it's not just oh i've seen a cryptid i mean you might get people you know, you know in, the, in the us and say oh you know i saw some big hairy creature da 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 um, and yes, they seem to seem seem to leave physical traces behind, and, and it is feasible that out there in the middle of nowhere, in the vast plains of forests and areas where humankind don't live, that some of those strange things do exist. I mean, after all, you know, it took us after finding the first panda, it took us sixty years to find the second one, <laughs> and it's black and white and lives in a jungle which is all green, and it only eats one type of thing, and it moves very slowly. And yet it took 60 years to find the second one. You know, the uh, it's not that they're acting elusively, you know, and evasive. They're just, they live in regions where humans just don't go and, or don't travel and don't traverse it very very easily. Uh, and it's no different than the wild man of Borneo. You know, there's you some intriguing reports and things like that, but trying to get there, it's a freaking nightmare. You know, it's just not a terrain you, we do very well in. Um, so we may never find it, you know, if there is such creatures like that. But I also think there's something else, and it's a phenomenon at play that represents itself very similar. Sometimes you might say the red eyes might be a giveaway. Absolutely. Mm, it, it's it's one of those discussions that can go on and on and on. I think, and I think I know we have talked about doing a round table on this this subject because that I think I think it'd be sure. a to get get a few minds together and sit down and, and, and mash this out for a few hours. I think it'll be people that would really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Winters asking, Steve, what is your opinion of the Alan Godfrey case? Oh, God. Do I have to answer that one? <laughs> 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 well, <clears throat> I don't want to. I don't want to get into that too much, really. I was involved in the early investigations with Alan, about Alan Godfrey. Um, the initial story about the wandering, you know, the, the cows manifesting, uh, reappearing and disappearing in people's gardens and stuff. It was just total rubbish. The, there were two entrances to the park. Um, the calls came into the police. There was nothing unusual about it. The, the cows had got out wandering through several gardens. Um, you know, nothing strange about that. Uh, regarding the actual incident itself, you know, you got to look at the... Although I'm not going to say I can give some clues, there was, there was timings about when the incident took place um, and remarks to the swirling amount of uh, leaves, you know, from the trees which were swirling around in a circular fashion like the craft was. Um, if you know that location and the timing of that when an incident took place, you might come across things that you, you'd question. There's also questions to, you know, yeah, lots of different, <laughs> lots of different things. We came up with a lot of problems, a lot of problems with it. Um, I mean, back to even, you know, the Adamski, you know, Zyg Zygmunt Adamski. I mean, the, saying that he was found on top of a coal heap and strange markings on him which had been analysed and it was from some alien substance. And I just thought, you know, when we got our hands into this, you know, the, it turns out that what he had done is joined a, the heart attack didn't kill him straight away. Um, he struggled. And uh, he ended up climbing, uh, well, literally crawling along the floor um, underneath machinery and stuff where battery acid got onto him, got onto his, some of his clothing, got onto his skin. 
Um, it fermented, burnt the skin. This is where samples were taken from. It's said to have been some type of alien goo or something. I mean, oh, I mean, but I won't, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I can't hold my hands up and say um, his incident didn't happen. Um, but what I can, can say, I can hold my hands up and say, I know the person, I knew the person very well who he was involved with in regarding hypnosis. And um, I know the guy who hypnos hypnotized him was called Joseph and had a school cap on because he was Jewish. And I know that he reported seeing a figure on board the craft called Joseph with a school cap on. <laughs> and the same thing. His first initial reports was there was a there was a, a man, human looking man with a skull cap on, presumably looking Jewish. And um his name was Joseph. Also to when he looked, he saw an ugly looking dog and lamp headed robots. I've got all the official initial reports there, photos, documents, a lot. From the from the actual day. The case file now is the little Greek, the little grey man with black eyes and da 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 da. And all you got to do if you've been in the ufology long enough is follow the train and uh, and see how much that story's changed. Um, though that I do not believe any form of hypnosis was reliable, not with the likes of who was involved conducting that, because he was he was brought to let's say he was let's say he was he was known for other things which were dodgy. And was confronted by many, many UK ufologists. And, I, you know, I could call my hand up. I can guarantee there's another 30 ufologists out there. I'll stand by that. You know, absolutely. And this gentleman was referred to as Harry Harris. And uh, so it's problematic. Though that I can't hold my hands up and say 100% he didn't experience anything, I can certainly hold my hand, both hands up and suggest that this, I would not take it as conclusive evidence. No, I, th I think what you what you're saying there, Steve, is that you're demonstrating why it's important to have multiple, you know, eyes look over a case and share information because, uh, yeah. all right, that has that has a downside, and I think you you come across a lot of that downside is that Chinese whispers start and things can get out of control. Much the same happened at Rendlesham, didn't it? Another well, yeah. Case. I mean, this is why I respect you know like Travis Walton's experience. It's never ever changed. He's never come up with new stuff. You know, there's no more story to add. Um, and it's, you know, it's the same story over and over again. And then years later, there's more evidence to add to it for the confirmation that something happened in that location. You know, that to me, you know, is, is sounds like an authentic experience, you know, because you don't add the fantasy to it because you relive the moment when you talk about it. Yeah. And I've seen Travis relive that moment when he, when he, time and time again. And now it's just robotic, really. So many people want to know. And he, of course, he just tells them, you know, well, you know, this is the story. This is all I know. You know, there's no drama. There's no, you know, profoundness been added to it. The icing on the cake. And you find that so many times. Um, but there are a number of cases, especially traditional English ones, which are problematic. And I think you have to thoroughly investigate it. And it's best that you involved round about the time of the, to the time because you realise back then that the story is different than it is now, and you have to question why is those individuals why did they change the story, you know? And this should be questioned about it, really, to be honest with you, because you know if you don't want to question about it, then fine, you know. But then you obviously when when they bring that information back out again and and it's got all these extra things added. You know, we should say, you know, why is it so different than your initial story? You know? Yeah, and, 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 and of course, that's back in the day when I suppose these days the people can get interested in a case for clicks and likes and, and, and all the rest of it. And, you know, back, back then there was none of that, really. There, was, there, was, there were no opportunities uh, to do that. Yeah. So it just shows that that sort of stuff does go on. As you said, you're not saying the, the event didn't happen. No. Highlighting the issues with, with with a lot of these cases. Yeah, I mean, you know, back in the day, you know, we did have confrontations, but that that was back in the day when the only way ufologists would communicate with each other was at events. We didn't have the internet, you know, and rarely did anybody have no other phone numbers to people. We had no way of coming together and talking apart from going to groups or conferences. And, uh, you know, the things I've seen at conferences, 
you know, from the through the eighties was uh, hysterical, absolutely hysterical. I've seen punch ups. I've seen people drank off the stage, and <laughs> you know, I mean, do you know what? It was a real hardcore ufologists really going at each other. And do you know what? Even though it was interesting. You know, I don't think it would have warranted anything good for the for the, the actual research, to be honest with you. But that was a way of finding out things. You know, they battled it out, literally. And we had no shame in, once the internet came along and people had a voice over, over, over the world, then a lot of people got quickly destroyed, you know, because they'd been at it pulling stunts for years and years and years and getting away with it. And then all of a sudden the internet came along. And of course, a lot of them, cleared away you know leaving some of the more hardcore ufologists that still some of them still continue today to be honest yeah. you know which is great no, that's a good answer steve uh, uh Lorraine, can you put next question up please <clears throat> steve uh hi steve can't see that do nato do any form of ufo investigation well i did a bit of work for nato many years ago i was in telecommunications at rf weathersfield in Essex. And um, I was stationed there um, doing uh, telecommunications, of all things. Um, I do know from me being there um, that I wasn't aware of any talk on UFOs or anything like that. But I also know by talking with, who used to be a very good friend, Bob Dean, um, Many people may have known him, ufologists, from the um, the, the Shape Report, S-H-A-P-E. Um, and Bob was a regular visitor and um, lecturer on the subjects of UFOs after he retired from, from NATO. And uh, he, had a, he was an extremely high-ranking officer with literally top-secret clearances. I think it might have been ultra-top-secret. And... Um, the information that he put forward that, yes, absolutely, NATO are aware of UFO phenomena. They've documented it, investigated it. Um, there is paperwork on these things. And one of the most significant is, if you can get a hold of it, is the SHAPE, S-H-P-E, the SHAPE report. And uh, it was put out. It was off time, my Bob Dean put it out. Um, and uh, they were regular monitoring of foreign or... Oh, they thought initially we were following UFOs, turned out to be. didn't belong to the USSR, they didn't belong to us, they didn't belong to America, but they were traversing across from one country to the other, just backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and they realised very quickly, after initially being alerted, thinking it was some type of enemy attack, that uh, they were, in fact, unidentified and continued to do this on an operational basis. And they were very well documented by the NATO. NATO have been heavily involved in the UFO phenomena uh, for many years. Mm, absolutely. And there's a great documentary, actually, on Richard D. Hall's channel called uh, yeah. UFOs and NATO. I think that's in two parts. But that's a, if, if no one's seen that, anyone watching this that hasn't been on Richard D. Hall's YouTube channel or his website, that's a, a really good documentary, UFOs and NATO. Check that out. Uh, it is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, next question, please, Lorraine. Ah, Lee Roscoe. Hi, Lee. Uh, thanks for your time tonight, Steve. First of all, what's the most outstanding story you have worked on and you will never forget? Story? Well, account story. The account, the investigation. Um, probably some of the most popular, I think when we, we have breakthroughs about the phenomena, and what it actually truly represents. We are in part of a study program um, known as for, uh, Project Doorway, which I work with a number of people. Um, um, Barry Fitzgerald from Ireland is also um, one of the principal investigators. Uh, but there's, it also involves a, um, a couple of think tanks, information from high source areas of UAP phenomena currently, um, things that aren't normally circulated to the general public um, because. There are study programs going on in this field, and we are advancing. Um, I, though I can't get into it all because, you know, some things I can't sell, say. Um, I can certainly tell you that we're going. We're in for some surprises, and I think you're starting to see that if you listen to anybody who's talking about, you know, the Pentagon stuff the, the, these days, Louis, uh, Louis and, uh, and other people. Um, 
they're saying things without saying because they know things I know um, and they're desperate. They really are. These people are desperate to tell the public, but at the same time comes at a cost and that cost is the amount it affects scientifically. Um, the amount of scientific advancement since the, the days that the Pentagon came out and talked about UAP has been incredible. It's been incredible. We've got scientists coming out from the corners now and want to know about this phenomenon. I want to lend a hand. I want to provide their academic skills to try and conclude what the hell's going on. What we cannot do is suddenly provide them the woo-woo. Because I'll tell you now, we all know. We all know there's woo-woo. And that's that stuff which is just, what the hell does that mean? You know, with connotations. I mean, all you've got to do is look at the last interview that Professor Hal Putoff did over YouTube with uh, Harvey Weinstein when he references demonic technology. I'm not going to go into it too much, but there's an undertone here of research is taking place in the background quietly because it cannot be presented to the scientific community like that. They have to endure through the process of what we currently know and get up to our speed before we can even consider them to digest any woo-woo. Because if we don't, we scare them away. And if we scare them away, that means that it's going to cause us problems. Problems in trying to fast-track conclusions. We need those brains. We need those academic skills. You've got to be very careful how we tread in the garden in this matter. Yet, people at the top know it exists. So trying to find them out what we're really dealing with, that's the big question. And for me, I think that's the most incredible thing um, that we are now moving into a slightly different area of research regarding the UFO phenomena or UAP phenomena, we'll call it how you will, um, which has always had these undertones, but now we're recognising them and in close circles, in the darkness, in the whisperings, in the corner, is going on. At some point, it will come out and we're going to learn more about the world we live in, the metaphysics, the reality, parallel worlds, quantum physics, you name it. And that is where this phenomenon seemingly is lying. So for me, that's I would say that's the most the most interesting of all things now. I thought I was just going to stay on the same thing forever and we're never going to get answers. But we are truly chipping away at the block now. We're getting places. Yeah, I know you make good you make good points there, Steve. I think the I think the, the interesting one for uh, you know us armchair ufology, if you want to call us that, is that we're waiting there's always there's always a part of me that because I know they know. And when I say they, mm. I don't know specifically who I'm talking about, but I, they do know what's going on and they, and they understand the phenomena whole fully. They know mm. how all this works. Yeah. Then you've got, I mean, it's a hierarchy, isn't it? Then you've got the, the next few rungs down the ladder and then you've got, yeah. Yeah, eventually it gets to you and scientists and scientific it, groups. The, the UAP, UAP and UFO phenomena, we look at it as a page, like a page. This is, represents a subject. But in fact, that page is broken down into six pieces of paper put together to make a page. It's like six areas. And some of them are uncomfortable. Some of them people don't want to get into. And you can't just walk away from it because you can't ignore it because it is fundamentally one of the pieces of this phenomena. And some people don't want to do go down that road that one of the pieces of these phenomena for one reason or another. But it's the only way to fathom it is when we take them all together and we don't shy away from from trying to find out what they are and providing those details to the general public for us to get a better understanding of it. It's it's that's where the problem lies. You've got so many people that do not want to go into certain areas of research, uh, and we have to. We forcefully have to. Here's an interesting question, so we'll just have to be careful how we word this, Steve, in, in, in regards to the, the, the one word. And David's asking, do you believe that the human mutes are going on, and who do you believe is doing it? I do believe they do go on. I mean, I was, I was part of a sit-down meeting. I can't go into too much of the subject, but what I can tell you regarding, let's refer it to the naughty stuff. Yeah, you know, okay. that's a good way of putting uh, it, yeah. The naughty stuff that should never that never gets talked about, um, he's been ignored. There's a perfect example for this phenomenon, you know? Ooh, let's not do that, let's not go there. 
Um, and you rightly so. A lot of people don't want to do that. Um, yes, I was down part of a sit down meeting. And funny enough, it's funny you mention that because Bob Dean was there. I was um, I was at a meeting with um, uh, Tony Dodd. I think it was his 1993. I think this was in Leeds. At a, a, a lock room meeting, which there was myself, uh, a couple of other guys who I didn't know. Uh, I know Bob Dean was there and Tony Dodd was there, and six files were brought out and put on the table. And we all analyzed those. I got, I do not know where those files came from. I don't want to know where they came from, to be honest with you. But there were six of those cases with a lot of photographs, a lot of information. Um, when they were discovered, they were analysed. The the bodies were the everything was done as properly, and none of it was released. Will ever release to the public for for obvious reasons. Um, I was aware of six back then of that. Um, I have since then, since ninety three, came across two others, and then I analysed uh, the three from the dialogue pass incident i know there was more affected but i analyzed three of the uh, the initial uh, uh, investigation documents those two are very questionable um yeah it goes on it does happen and uh and it's like it does happen across numerous different types of animals you know we all talk about cattle but you know what it's I got it in 1993 throughout Yorkshire. It was it was hens, chickens, foxes, deer, you know. Um, but the phenomena was still present. It's also been present in the marine life and seals. Um, it's also been present in birds, flying birds, you know, uh, those type of things. Um, now it's now at this moment in time, as I speak, you know, France are going through a hell of a problem with with horses. You know, it's, it's it's on a mass scale. It's been going on for a long time. Um, and it does predate our technology to even do so. So let's just give up on that answer straight away. It's, it's us. Um, it isn't. Uh, uh, but we are heading towards, like I say, in those circles, we are coming up with ideas and reasoning behind the phenomena. And a little clue to that would be the mucous membrane. And it all leads to immunity. You know, uh, and you, when you start to consider how long a phenomena is present in our environment, which is very, very short, because sometimes we're mostly taken to their environment, is why did it not sustain themselves very long in our environment? And the thing is, what if a phenomena can sustain itself in our environment if they have the immunity to do so? If that's the case, and it is down to an immunity, which I think it is, then what will happen when the phenomena has the capabilities of sustaining itself in our reality for long periods of time? Uh-oh. <laughs> Interesting times to come, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way of putting it. Yeah, but that, that is, yet, yet again, this, is, this, this goes back to the, to the whole roundtable discussion a bit because this is with the, uh, another subject that you can go round and round and round. And I think there's a lot of fascinating angles to this uh, I mean, you talked about the mucous membrane stuff, and the, when I was, when Paul was doing, Paul Sinclair was doing that investigation up, up in Bempton, we sat at there at nights talking about this stuff, trying to figure out what on earth is the reasoning behind this. And as you mentioned, this is, I remember you, you were talking once about the uh, the Indian farmers and how they used to use, and in fact, in this country as well, I think uh, yeah. they, they were using long iron nails, yeah. weren't they? Iron rods. You talk about that. Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, traditionally, you know, it's surprising how much people have used iron. I mean, raw iron type iron to deter phenomena, negative phenomena. I don't say always well, positive. I say phenomena, but mostly it's negative stuff. You know, medieval times. You know, iron nails were placed around bedrooms to rid homes of of those not not nice things at night and and especially which were invading people's nightmares and horrors and things like that and it seemed really worked you know to stop children being abducted from the cribs in ireland you know they started using iron rods to, to put over the cribs to, to keep them safe you know um farmers all over the world not just in you know in the uk and ireland places 
all over the world during certain periods of time were utilizing iron rods driven into the ground uh, to protect livestock from being abducted, taken, or mutilated, uh, mut or, or that naughty word, you know? Yeah. So, um, iron is in there, it's, in it's intrinsically there. I mean, in, in Middle East, we look at, you know, why people wear hematite. You know, it's mostly it's like 90% iron, you know? And it's associated to protecting yourself from the gin. Yeah. All things, which is just a different name, a different name, but same phenomena and a different mass. And and of course, when you really look around, you take a walk down the street. That's all you got to do, and go past the next the your, your local church and graveyard, and just sit there and watch, and just look, and question, why is there a perimeter of raw iron between the church and and, and another region? And that could be the graveyard, or it could be separating the church with the graveyard from another region. But why? What is it in medieval times that they thought they could use iron as hold off a perimeter against this phenomenon? And um, most recently, after doing, I was interviewed by the Free Foundation, which is a Mitchell Foundation for the uh, uh, research of extraterrestrial you know experiences and so they contacted me because they wanted to they got they were very interested about the surveys that we've done in regarding people who experiences um some of them were um, believed to have been having contact with beings from somewhere else i don't say alien abduction but you know those type of experiences where we absolutely determine you know we determine through conclusive evidence we impact the amount and the consistency of these experiences if those experiencers wear iron and have it to the skin. Um, and seemingly, it was working. You know, it was working well. And uh, they're really interested in that because, you know, negative phenomena doesn't seem to like iron. Now, people, I can just see people out there going, why? 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 What is it about iron? Well, maybe I don't. We don't know. We're still working on that. It could be the resonant frequency of iron could just bugger up. You know, whatever's going on with this phenomenon, it just dislikes it. But one thing, I mean, it does. I believe it does protect to some degree. I mean, I'd rather have it. <laughs> I'd rather have it than not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I, uh, I I do what I can tell you though. It doesn't work underground. So if you're going into caves and stuff, and we've done a lot of that, especially Barry, um, it won't protect you. You've got Is no that protection. something to do with UV then? I believe so. Yeah, and there's all there's all writings about you know whatever you know the sun lands on is is, is our domain. Whatever it doesn't is theirs, and, and you know and it it doesn't do anything for you underground whatsoever. No way. Uh, so you're unprotected. You know, that's that's a well, you know what, well, that's our own fault, probably treading over the line into their domain and something. But you know what, there's a lot of strange stuff going on in caves and uh, underground. And the phenomena, mostly the aerial phenomena that we see, most people are always looking up, you know what, but intrinsically, it's connection, geological connection to the ground is the strongest one. We just don't know it. You know, you want to know where UFOs are, go, then it's, there'll be a geological answer somewhere. Yeah, well, there's equally as many cultural myths regarding uh, those gods from the sky as there are the gods from within or the, the, the creatures yeah, from within yeah. the earth. Exactly. You know, and, and yeah. of course, we uh, that again, this is another show. It's, it's just it, this, this stuff yeah, goes on and on. Yeah, I mean, we could go on to that page, you know, underground, the underworld, and all that sort of thing. There is references to it in every single culture. Uh, around this planet, and it has been going on for a long, long time, even to the point where um, um, alleged manifestations with these deities were taking place with our ancient civilizations, and it didn't go well sometimes, and therefore that some of these ancient civilizations destroyed some of their own ancient sites to protect themselves from what comes through certain areas. I mean, there's a lot yeah. more going on that meets the eye, and now we know surprisingly that a lot of these ancient sites which were and found to be still active 
have been A, relocated, or B, disconnected geologically from the ground. You wouldn't know that by travelling to Egypt and temples like that. You wouldn't know that deep beneath the, the stone you're walking on is a layer of wood because they've just disconnected it from the geological source on purpose. You know, they were, uh, there are people out there that know a lot more than what, what, we, what the general public do. It's going on all over the place. You know, I've seen it firsthand in Peru where, you you know, there's one particular location and you go there and it's a fountain. It's it's a pre-Inca fountain. Water flows off the top of it and hits a, a, a purpose small stone granite pyramid. Water hits the top of it. And then all of a sudden you suddenly go and you find that, well, that pyramid's gone. They've chiseled the bloody thing off. You know, why? Why did it do these things? You know, it's, uh, it, it's a shame. But you know what? I think that they just the secret is is, is, is a big secret. And it's, it's, I think it's, they find a reason that to worthy enough to keep it so. Uh, just by even damaging and changing things, you know. it's. Uh, I think it's happening a lot. There, there's many sites out there that we think are, in this in, in situ as they originally were and they're not you know there's they know where they are you know and uh but you don't get to hear those things unfortunately well our ancient our ancient past is deeply connected to 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 this modern ufology then that is yet another part of the of the history that, that's that's the reason people talk about well it, it, this is they keep the the ancient history stuff hidden for religious purposes or or whatever no they don't do oh, that for religious no. purposes they do it because it's connected to everything else yes that's right don't it's a domino that. all of these are dominoes aren't they if one of the dominoes goes the whole thing goes so that's right you get these gatekeepers it's amazing though that you know that the the knowledge based on this is international the chinese government the Russian government, the American government, the Australian government, UK government, you know, they've known this all for a long time. They know that they can utilise this to their advantage by building weapon plants, uh, weapon manufacturing areas, chemical facilities for war chemicals uh, in areas where ancient sites are list uh, ancient, uh, ancient sites are. Um, and certain key geological areas where there's, uh, you know, negative magnetic anomalies. That's done for a reason. I don't know if it's because it's um, it's for their advantage and it makes them more successful or empowerment or whatever. I don't know. There's certainly, to me, there's esoteric reasonings behind it, which they are aware of and we're not. Um, and it's still very current today. You know, it's still the same thing about, you know, the power of belief um, tied with the geology of the land creates something, you know, and that, that can create things and change things to the point where you can conjure an event. You know, you can physically conjure something up by the power of belief, you know, and therefore it empowers your odds of being more successful. You know, you have to question, why do all these people do these things? Why do so many secret societies do that? Because it, it, it warrants something. It makes a change. We can't break reality, but we can certainly bend it to our advantage. And I think they find ways of doing so. It's that old shape. Absolutely. You're totally right. And, and of course, that goes, you can, you, can, you can get into the gin who were bound by iron rings. <laughs> and you can get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. round and round, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Are you, are you, Steve, are you all right for 10 more minutes? I'm fine, yeah. yeah. I've just got a few more questions. Learn, do you want to put yeah. the next question up, please? I, I know, well, I know you've got views on this. Uh, any views on the skull experiment? Uh, okay, well, I'm very much aware of skull experiment. Um, and, um, I know Robin Freud very well. We've, we've been in discussions. Barry's told to in length. Um, yeah, I mean, the skull experiment was, <clears throat> as far as I'm aware, everything was real. The manifestation did take place. The people that were involved there purposely went there of all different backgrounds and academics to try and disprove it. They never could. You know, in fact, they they had physical connection with the phenomena. You know, the manifestations they held, you know, they experienced this stuff. Um, it was it's real. It was real. It took a long time to get there um, and a lot of building to do. 
uh, on trying to get the right types of energies and selection of individuals just right for, to be, you know, to, to work. And of course, um, to be in contact with the right type, the right source. It took a long time to build the skull experiment. And it's absolutely real. Um, then came the, um, the further experiments uh, through skull. People don't often hear. And that was in that was uh, uh, associates of mine and researchers um, who were involved in that. Where they were, again there were manifestations of <laughs> of play of dinner size play UFOs of all things real flying around the room lights shining down on, onto the table UFOs uh, some of which were able so the, the the light phenomena had mass to it you could. It would land in your hands. You could feel the mass. You could close your hands and the light would come through and you could feel the weight to it. You know, there was interactions and things taking place. But, of course, when you start to realise about why the reasoning of Skull being shut down, because there was a loss of control. And um, there were some concerns about, you know, well, I can't go into it too much, to be honest with you. There were some concerns um and the reasons why it was shut down um there was kind of an invading force and it was not seen to be of human origin and some of that phenomena still remained and still does remain with robin to this day and others who have been involved in it i mean it's like there's no different than the skinwalker you know you, you go want to go there and get involved like nids, nids did they pay. They paid a price. It has a sting in its tail. This for no one. And the negativity that it can reap through your life is can be havoc. And I think uh, you know. I think uh, Bob Bigelow came out and told us that last year when he interviewed with George Knapp about how his life was just turned upside down after doing that. He wish he'd never probably done it. You know, the amount of problems he's had, and not just for him, other members of NIDS as well. So I mean, he does have a sting in its tail. You've got to be careful. Um, we went one further then from, to, from the second stages of uh, Project Door, uh, sorry, the second stages of Skull Experiment, we went into Phenomena Project, which was, again, advanced studies in Skull. Um, and uh, it was incredible, some of the stuff, you know, we can get movement and manifestation and stuff like that is it's in, in, incredible. Um, you know, I mean, there's some of the things that turned up. I mean, it was interesting to say about the newspaper during the Skull Experiment, this is brand new newspaper on aged old uh, on aged newspaper printed on newspaper you know it's just it's like you've just plucked it from the 1930s you know and um, what was fascinating those apports that stayed the newspaper aged roughly about 500 days per day afterwards because the amount it browned was very quick and there's a period of time how that happens when not in direct UV light. And that period of time can be analysed against the time it would have been manifested. It worked out that the paper, once it apported and appeared, aged roughly 500 days per day. You know, so and it's, it, 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 that's just one of the things, you know, it's, it's actually really incredible, some of the stuff. Um, and it's closely associated to very similar to the German Metaphysical Society, which became the Vril Society. Yeah. Their communications went one, little, one, one, one bit further in regard in obtaining information of advanced technology, which would have been fed back to German authorities, of course, you know. Uh, and they vanished. They got, all the team completely vanished. And there was just one little one note left saying that they no longer wanted to be here anymore. <laughs> Be never seen again, <laughs> strangely enough. <laughs> uh, Steve Tino's asking that uh, uh, do you think the scientists in the skull experiment were trickster spirits then? Were trickster spirits the scientists? I don't know whether they ever referred to uh, these the, 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 the spirits as scientists. Uh, maybe I, I'm not that clued up on the skull okay, experiment. Well, they, you know, during the skull experiment, there was a number of different people from the other side. I say people with very loosely, of course. Um, because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just don't, uh, I mean, we had, a, we had a great time when we could, I mean, we get people come forward and say, oh, you know, my name's John, and I was 
I born here and I live there and I'm buried there and I died here and you nice guy. And we had these great sheets, literally printed out stuff, which could turn them straight away. When you say turn them, it was a set of questions. There were 20 questions on this sheet. It always worked as well, crazy enough. Uh, and you, you, you convert them basically from a, a nice loving spirit to a demonic entity that wants to break your legs in 20 yeah, questions. Funny that, isn't it? <laughs> 20 questions. 20 questions are attempted to do it, you know. Um, but there were a lot, the biggest, there is a word of warning about this. When the biggest problem that we have with dealing with this phenomena is its deceit, and its deception, and its lies. And lies, and lies. You know, it's just, uh, and and it, and you know what? It's time for us is not like time for that. You know, it can go, it can do that for twenty five years, and keep it going. You know, uh, and reveal itself after twenty five years. It can do. It's just not like what what we experience as time. Um, that's a problem because we know that we've had, we know that we've manifested stuff like this. And it says it's this, that, and the other. We know it isn't because it was manifested. You know, it was through the process of the gunja. Um, so we know that, you know, these things just pluck out any old thing. Um, I don't know if any of that phenomena represents true spiritual contact. I'll be honest with you. I don't think there's any evidence of true spiritual contact. I believe there's evidence of communicating with something that says it's spiritual contact. And because the biggest problem that we had of on our, we're now up in our research, the advanced studies of this skull stuff, what we did with Project uh, Phenomena, is that when we did eventually get to the stage of being, uh, being able to ask questions, and it took us a long time, but to ask questions and get clear vocal responses, some of which were, were, DV, were DVs, which, you know, direct voice phenomena DVPs, um, always above you as well for some reason, <laughs> if you stood or not, um, was problematic because they all they gave the answers often before we gave the question. So they knew what we were thinking. And if they can if they, if this phenomenon knows what we're thinking, then how on earth can we prove it's a, it's it, it says what it is. It is because it can give us exactly what we want to confirm that. So that's the problem here. And that's how that line of grand deception can work through this phenomena. Um, it basically just tells us, if you, you know, it can tell you, you can read your mind. And if you think it's Uncle Albert who passed away last year, or read it, you read your mind and produce itself. Oh yeah, I'm Uncle Albert. And then you might ask, you might ask a question. What would you ask a question that you would only know? Uh, hello? You know, not only you know it, because everything else knows it as well, and that will just provide it for you, and that will that will seal a certain connection with this phenomenon, and that's where it starts getting bad. You don't connect with this phenomenon, and I'll keep saying to people about this. You know, there's no love and light there. Um, but you know, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a tricky one, Chris. It really is. People need to be educated more, basically, about that. But yes, I mean, you know, it's. You don't go into it blindly, I would say. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? When you look, I mean, if you look in the last 40, 50 years of, 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 of ufologists and writers and researchers and this whole love and light angle, uh, the new age movement, if you like. I, had a, I mean, I've talked a lot about with James Bartley about this mm. because, because it seems that anyone is, that is hypercritical of the love and light and the and even even if you highlight in potential dangers or issues in the deceit area so let me get this straight a bunch of whatever they are took you from your room against your wishes but you but they your mate <laughs> now they're your best mate and now they can now they just take you they're still taking you and they're doing awful things to you in some cases mm. but they do good things in other cases because sometimes they fix you and the, the, yeah. these people genuinely don't understand why some researchers have a, have a huge problem with it, and, and certainly some experiencers who are now researchers who have yeah. who have experienced that stuff, they're they're saying, "Look, I'm sorry, I cannot say that I think these guys uh, are love and light because I, I didn't get any of that." We don't. We shouldn't apply our own agendas to it. This is the problem because we we are forced to try and think 
it's, it's human character to do so, is to put it in a box. Is it a good experience? Is it a bad experience? You know, I mean, anybody, you go, you go and buy a dog from the, from the, from the pound, for an example, you don't get the dog from the pound. You know, sometimes it's going to lick, look, lick you, it's going to love you, it's going to, you know, it's going to wag its tail, and then sometimes it's going to bully you back you. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't, we wouldn't sit there and say, that's a bad dog, or it's a good dog, you know, because it just, it's, it's, it's just, it is what it is. We're always trying to find it. If people come in, if three police officers come in to arrest somebody and drag them away to the police station, you know, are they doing a good job or a bad job? Well, that's perspective. On perspective, you know, somebody might say, well, it was a bad experience because the police told me, oh, was it, you know, it's actually, it's a good experience. I'm doing a job. You know, it's a, it, it, while we're always looking to try and conclude it in a box, I've often asked people, you know, about their experiences, and they say, well, why do you think it was a good experience? They said, because nothing bad happened. <laughs> I said, oh, when it becomes <laughs> I said, well, yeah. when it becomes a bad experience, I don't even realise, yeah? I mean, what if it's just a gender? They don't care. They tell us all these beautiful stories and things. Don't worry. Oh, it's a shame you got hurt and you're scarred for life, you know, or you've, you know, you've lost your vision, you left eye for life, you know. Oh, well, we're very unfortunate, you know, but we mean well. And, 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 you know, and you think to yourself, what? You know, why people want to swallow this rubbish, you know, um, because there's nothing love and light about this. You know, it's invasive. It doesn't care about what the what the phone doesn't care about us, doesn't care about what it does, you know, and it keeps putting this message out, you know. It's like a one liner, isn't it? If you get caught, this is your one liner, you know, or you know, and it's always, you know, oh, oh, do look after planet Earth. Do look after planet Earth. Do you want to look after planet Earth? I've been saying this message for the last sixty years, they've got to done it themselves. You know, I mean, and then they go on, oh, you know, it's love and light. Well, they don't care about us. They don't stop wars and mass mass problems and stuff. Never have, never will. There's that. That's how much they care. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm very dubious about the whole deceit behind the phenomena because I don't think people can identify it very well uh, because of deceit. And it really is the master of deceit. I mean, you don't have to read go far to find what the master of deceit is involved with. Well, I mean, Spurska, that lot is asking an interesting question here, and, and I guess this ties right in. This is probably why she asked it. I mean, because James Gilliland and, and the Assetti Ranch, James is one of those guys, along with Peter Maxwell Slatter, that that have had very ex, uh, positive experiences and all the lives and with contact phenomena, but also do mention the negative uh connotations that go along with this whether that be a, a different group of entities they're in touch with we don't know if it's the same group with two masks we we don't know that but mm. at least they're putting forward you know both sides of the coin if you like so well, that's good. space cadet law is asking would you ever consider going there oh absolutely yeah not a problem i don't, I, can, I, I will consider listen i've been doing it that long i will consider going anywhere these days <laughs> you know um I mean, I've met James a few times in Los Angeles, and I know about his ranch and stuff. And yes, there are things seen there, and there are interactions of some type of stuff that goes on. But you've also got to consider that these interactions are taking place in groups. Groups of people that are wishing and wanting for something to appear and manifest. That's the problem, you know, because basically what you have there is a, is a science circle. They just don't know it. It's the same thing with C setting, uh, and the same thing for uh, for for C five. It's exactly the same thing. You know, the phenomena can appear during C five experiences because you basically conjure the phenomena through through the will through through a circle. You know, be it five. It doesn't matter if you've got five mediums or five meditators. It's the same thing. It's just a different environment. It can happen in the right locations, uh, and especially if in locations where things like, you know, where they sort the ranches and right close to the mountain. Um, we were yeah, like going back to the beginning with thoughts about yeah. geology. Yeah. You know, these places are energized and are closely associated with the phenomena. Um, and the phenomena is not going to go far. I think, it's a, I think it's quite happy, you know. Oh, great. We're not going to go far to meet people that. Are willing to throw themselves at us, 
you know, there, are, there are interesting differences. Uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of, uh, I used to chat with Peter Maxwell Slaughter quite, quite a lot a few years back. And if you look at some of, some of his evidence, his photographs are, are amazing. You know, the live video that he shoots live with these groups. So I, I guess the question is that now, how does one differentiate between real phenomena and conjured phenomena? There's the question. Okay, I'll give you the answer. It lies in here, not here. Forget here. This can be tricked. Your eyes can be tricked. Your brain can be tricked. But here calm. Here's real. And what you do is you rely on this, rely on listening to your body, listening to the reactions your body says. If your body goes into alert reaction, if adrenaline and cortisone are released at the time of these incidents, it's your body's warning mechanism which is firing up. It's saying, you know, get the hell out of there, basically. You know, and you're demanding a choice because your body's telling you, only it's doing that for a reason. The body's putting you into a fight or flight mode to pump blood to your muscles because it knows you're going to have to enter into some type of combat or to flee the area quickly and you're going to need that extra blood to the muscles. You know, it's it, it knows. It's putting you in a defense mode because it's picking up on something. And that organism is responsible for that, as Barry's told, Barry said many times, um, it's your skin. It's the largest organism in your body, you know, and it reacts. It picks up on that. You can call it sixth sense intuition, whatever you want to call it. But when you get the goosebumps, and when you get that feeling, that is a warning mechanism kicking in saying just because you don't see something and you don't feel something, hear something, doesn't mean it's not there. Your body has a way of recognising that, that the other senses can be manipulated. That one can't, and we still have it. So listen to that, because I know when to walk away sometimes now, and it's only because the practice of Barry's taught me. And Barry knows how to do that. And we know that when we've overstayed our welcome, people can't make it. We've had people with us, and they said they can't understand it. We've just, there's a bloody object there in the sky. It's just appeared. It's, it's big. It's a close encounter incident. We're walking away. And they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? We're going. We're leaving, you know, because we know when it's, we shouldn't stay. Because it's very easy to get glamoured, you know, and the phenomenon puts on a lovely light display and you become glamoured by it and really what happens during that sense is that your sensory inputs changed and your perception uh, of your surroundings alter to the point where you become locked on the object you're literally glamoured by it and what's going through your mind is how fantastical it is but what's going on behind you on the ground is important you're not connected with that you don't know so uh, it's here that's where you learn over a period of time um, to be able to sense, you know, what is uh, probably not something not advantageous. Uh, Space Cadet Lottie is just asking, who is Barry? So you should, can you just oh, do, oh, give Barry, yeah. Barry Fitzgerald? Tonight. Barry, Barry Fitzgerald is, uh, is, um, is a principal investigator like myself on, the, on Project Doorway, which is the advanced studies of aerial phenomena and it covers numerous different scientific and academic as aspects of the of the, uh, the areas of study within the phenomena so um and we've been we 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 now know that we can go to locations where we would have contact experience we can go i know we can go to places now with people who've done it before proved it and have a close encounter experience and we know that we'd be successful, successful doing it uh, because there are key locations and there are key timings and things like that. And we put it to the test through our research and we were, we were right. You know, uh, the phenomenon utilises many places on planet Earth in key times, key locations. Um, and we, we have put that to the test many times. And uh, so Barry, Barry works closely with me on that. We've travelled the world. Um, and uh, we've done numerous different experiments. Uh, it's very interesting. It's, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll put some links in the description, uh, Steve, to, to map it and ver the Project Doorway and various videos. Uh, I'll have to get very yeah, on at some, at some um, stage. It's actually up. There's actually one I shared from one of our own channels. It's, uh, it's Barry Fitzgerald being interviewed about this phenomena. 
and it's actually up on um, it's up on my page on my Facebook page, Steve Miller, at the moment. I think it was from yesterday. You're probably you're probably hearing say a lot of the similar things I do, though. <laughs> Yeah, and and the thing is with this, whenever I see in, and and watch interviews like this, what what ends up happening, especially when you've got chat and people involved in 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 the conversation, you realise sometimes you'll start talking about a subject, even when you're involved in it, like we are, and then yeah. there's so when uh, there's so many different angles and inputs, you realise, wow, this this is this is huge. Yeah, the whole, you know, all the all the different elements and angles to it, all it. leading to the same roundabout same thing. Uh, just and, and it's any no wonder we're all bloody fascinated by it. And what? And, you know. Well, we are. I mean, it's the biggest thing, isn't it? Is to be is to be consumed by fascination about, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that we should be heavily involved with. Because, like I say, when you do become heavily involved in it. There is problems that can occur in your life. And I mean, and I don't mean just by chance. I mean, you know, you by the end of it, you'd be saying, Some, I've got an attachment. Something is just rip, ripping right through my life, ruining it. You know, I mean, if you do, any of the listeners get a chance to listen to the interview I've done from last, last February. Uh, by George Knapp with Bob Bigelow, he actually confirmed he actually eventually, eventually came forward and said about his involvement with NIDS and Skinwalker Ranch, and they were trying to entice phenomena to manifest, take place. And, you know, they had some interesting stuff happen, and um, but it, you know, if too much, too soon. Um, it, it, he didn't do him good. He didn't do him good. And he ripped right through Bob's life, you know, his, his whole family, his whole family. And he, he explains that to George. So, it's, you know, you need to listen to these people that have done it. We have to know when to back off. And it's just like the power normal. It's like you're know, sitting around on a Ouija board. You know, it's no different. You're going to keep doing it. You know, something is going to come along and you're going to grab its attention. And uh, if it finds attachment, then you know you're in for a bit of a miserable life and you're going to be sat there saying well when anything happens bad it's always happens to me you know you're going to be one of them people you know and uh, and you can't do that you've got to you've got to know when to back off you know you've got to there is sometimes too much and uh, and too much involvement and that's why this these long studies into these experiences of communications with the other side are very long because they have to have breaks between, you know, because whatever this phenomenon is, it knows instantly where we are, what we're thinking, what we're doing. And this isn't surmising. This is proven actual fact evidence. We put tests on and they know instantly. So how do we ever believe the things we're being told? It's, it's problematic, isn't it? Right, we better make this the last one, Steve. Uh, can you ask Steve what he? This is from Cool Tools. Thanks, mate. Uh, can you ask Steve what he thinks about Rupert Sheldrake's experiments? Uh, I took part in the sports one, and now, and the now in perception of kids on autism spectrum and ADHD hyper KCD. Yeah, it's really fascinating Sheldrake's experiments, and I think that there's definitely something to it. I mean, I went, I, got, I went, I had, I had looked through them, and I thought I started looking at results. I started looking, listening to people about, you know, who had taken part in experiments and things like that. It is fascinating. Sometimes there's a product, a mechanism, and we just don't think that some things can be done, and we are capable of doing those things if we don't just think like that. If we don't think like that, we never put that cocktail together until we do it and it makes a change i mean i say anybody out there can can change their lives you don't need to want anything you just assume you already have it i keep saying the same thing but it does work it works for me it works for anybody else that's followed that same pattern assume you already have it assume the success assume that the things that you want in life and it will give it you you know it comes quirkily through strange coincidences and multiple serendipity the key to this phenomenon, the door name is multiple serendipity, you know, and you'll recognize it as the quirk. 
the quirky stuff. You know, that's quirky. How could that happen? That's the that's the door. You know, and uh, over a period of time, you'll recognise it, and you can put out for it, and you can obtain stuff. But you know, and it's it, there's a mechanism to this reality. You know, and we can change lots of things. Uh, and there are lots of people now in the academic world, like Sheldrake and others, which are conduct, you know, having these experiments and they're conducting them and finding some very interesting results. There are lots of people like that which are bending the realms of reality, I would say, you know, really pressing against reality and making a difference. Well, it's not, it's not, it's not by coincidence that the powers that be forever and a day have been burying this sort of information, ancient cultures, burying that information, burying their connection to the land, burying the connection to the, the universe, or if you want to call it that, all that stuff being buried. And at the same time, those that I called there earlier on, they have some connection to the, whatever this phenomena is because they utilize the same... Uh, they do. Yeah, the, the the same functions because if you think if you look at what they do to humanity on a daily basis, it's a constant downer. It's just yeah. non-stop, isn't it? It's just non-stop. The thing is, is you got to you got to consider is what the feed is. I mean, if we call it the feed, it's the where do you do direct that energy to, or what is it that you're directing it to? Should yeah. we? And what rewards do you get in return of that? Now, if you're going to go back, you know, in time, it was always blood worship, sacrifice, blood worship, blood worship to the deities, to the gods, the gods to that name. Do you know what? People think it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. How many people out there are Christian, Catholic? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Our God, our own God we know, demanded blood, demanded sacrifices, demanded people to kill the, each other. You know, <laughs> It's there, uh, just you can't be ignorant of these things, you know, that the gods wanted these things and probably still do in some cases, and these are probably rewards from it. Those rewards might come in time, but you know what? If it's health, wealth, or whatever it is, there's a source. And why would so much, so many people around the world in these hierarchy powers do it if there was no reward? They wouldn't. It'd be a pointless act. There is reward. They know the secrecy to uh, to reward. Yeah, I don't know if it's the right path, the righteous path, or not. Who knows? You know, because we it's a jumbled mess. Religion. We don't. There's lies and truths everywhere, and that's the society that we're brought into. Not to trust anything. Not to distrust each other. To keep that separation between the hierarchy and the lowerarchy, and that is so important to them because it's control. And it allows to breed negativity in the right direction. It can be utilized by them. So, and that's from ancient days right through to modern day societies and cults, which is exactly the same process and things. Uh, there is a something, and it can manipulate the reality that we have. Um, I wouldn't say it's a good, probably a good thing to get involved with. Sometimes it has its own price to pay, you know, um, but definitely evidence of it. And as you say, the secret is that we can also manipulate it back. We can. And that has yeah. to be hidden. It seems to well, me that that... It's division, you see, Chris. That's the problem. I mean, they, 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 you know, they, fall, they force us into division and not unity. Because with yeah. unity, we have some force and they, they don't like that. Every time there's evidence of unity, they come along and quickly mess it up. You know, and that's okay. why, obviously, that's why the power of positive thinking is is constantly rubbished in the mainstream. It's constantly uh, looked at as just just uh, hocus pocus nonsense because yeah. they, they they have to they have to squash that. Uh, it that can't get out because the power of millions of not even millions, hundreds of thousands of people thinking in a certain way can change things. Oh, anyway, yeah. that's another show altogether. Yeah. It is. And we're going to be here all night. Right, so that, all that's left to say is thanks very much, mate. I really appreciate you being on. I know everybody in the chat has, they appear to have loved the show. No surprise there. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, Lee Roscoe again, mate. Thank you very much for your super chat uh, donation. Very much appreciated. And last but not least, Lorraine, thank you very much for moderating tonight. It's been a great show. So next week, I'm having a rest next week. We're having a... Uh, a week off next week but there will be a guest the following week so thank you very much everybody for watching and tune in next time and i'll see you all soon